I'm going to call the meeting of the planning board on August 12th to order. Um, we'll take a roll call vote. Mary Foley? Here. Peter Morton? Here. Uh, Sue Philbrick's here. Ms. Holmes here. Corey Brewster's here. Laura? Here. Sarah? Here. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> sort of's good enough for us. Um, so everybody knows Mark. Resnick is sick. Um, he's going to try and log on, but um, I just spoke with him a bit ago. I'm not very optimistic. It doesn't sound good. Um, so I would like to do the approval not required first. Is the applicant here? Hi. Uh, I'm Bob Griffin here on behalf of uh, Mr. Palazzoli, the applicant. And this is really just a very simple lot line adjustment between uh, Greenbelt and Mr. Palazzola. You can, the Greenbelt parcel comes down here, and we're going to take 17,938 square feet out of their parcel, put it onto the Palazzola parcel. Palazzola owns these two parcels here. We're taking the an equivalent area and giving it to Greenbelt. So that's really all we're doing. So you're just swapping land. That's exactly right. Not making any new buildable lots. That's correct. It's all even, Stephen. Great. Any questions from the board? Uh, I, I would like to yeah, just just a touch slower. Than you do yeah. What's going where? Yeah. So Greenville owns this relatively large parcel here. It's fourteen point nine. includes that meters. yellow portion right there. It does include the yellow portion. So the yellow portion is going to be transferred to the Palazzola ownership. Palazzo owns this parcel and this parcel. So out of this little skinny parcel here, uh, we're going to take 8,300 square feet. And out of this larger parcel here, we're going to take another 9,600. These add up to the same amount of area that is being conveyed from Greenbelt. So that's why I say it's an even Stephen land swap. So these two parcels go to Greenbelt. This parcel goes to Palazzo. Any concerns that frontage access? Uh, you know? No, uh, Mr. Palazzo already has a house here and, and certainly makes his lot a little larger than it is, uh, you know, but uh, again, if you combine his line, his land, with this parcel and this parcel together, it's again, even Stephen. So if he loses some, he gets it back. Is there, um, so this is the Greenbelt Land Trust, is that right? Um, what is Greenbelt? Essex County Greenbelt Association, Inc. Okay, and um, so that's a public land trust. Is there public access provided to this Greenbelt track anywhere? Is there anything about that that's changing? Uh, I, I'm not aware of how Greenbelt's managing their property, but generally they do let the public onto their land. And there is nothing here that would affect their uh, access or uh, how they manage their land as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? I just, just, yeah. I'm sorry. I was only going to ask if Mark had had a chance to look at this as the planner yes. before today. Yes. Um, he and I met last Friday. Okay. And he said um, that it was just basically a swap, no new buildable lots, no change in access from the road, um, no issues uh, regarding uh, the public way. So he felt comfortable with it. Okay. Um, I don't want to speak with for him, but right. that's where it is. I think you just had asked the answer to my question. <laughs> yeah. okay. It's just a simple exchange of some of the properties. Yeah. Yes, that that's correct. I'm now oh, here. Mark. Oh no. yay! <laughs> so, so you said exactly what what we discussed, and then furthermore, I also spoke uh, with the. The soon to be new director, uh, who's the uh, uh, person in charge of land uh, for uh, Greenbelt, um, Chris, I think it's the point, and uh, uh, yeah, and they're just uh, just doing a land swap to address some encroachment from um, uh, landscaping and a small and some stone walls and fences. So that's that's the entire purpose of this. That's, I assume that's, this is agreeable to both parties. So. Of course, yeah. 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 So, uh, this is Sarah. 
soon. Yes. Um, that was my question is that do we have uh, any documentation that it's okay, that it's uh, uh, both landowners are um, in agreement? Um, that's the first question. And then the second question, second comment, I guess, is to Gail. Um, I will be abstaining from this because I'm on the board of Green Hill. So we have an application that's signed by both parties. Okay, thank you. I can't see it on my end, so thank you. <laughs> Simple question. If this has to be submitted to the Registry of Deeds and the, the property lines change with the different areas, it, does it have to go through the normal procedures? Yes, it, 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 that's exactly right. So this plan would be recorded at the Registry of Deeds, and then a deed which uh, referencing that plan would be uh, executed between the two parties to make the conveyances complete. Okay. Sarah, anything else? Anything else from the board? Uh, so we go one thing. Uh, typically, we endorse these on the condition that it's not an approval of any zoning approval. That's correct. In fact, that language is on the plan already. Right plan? Yeah. Or wetlands. Um, I see the wetlands one. Okay. <clears throat> Planning board endorsement does not certify compliance with zoning bylaws. Nor here is this weapons may exist on the parcels. No official verification of any weapons. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to move that we endorse the uh, uh, approval not required plan. I hope we get all these references right. <laughs> uh, based on a survey prepared by uh, LeBlanc Survey Associates. Needed uh, July 18th, um, 2024, uh, for a land swap of land between Thomas Palazzolo, 25 Forest Line, and the uh, Essex County Greenbelt Association. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion from the board? Are you ready to vote? Is there Mary? Yes. 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 Thank you all very much. Thank you. Sir, I'm staying to the Right. Thank you, Chris. So, Gail, since Eric, uh, Sarah is staying, I'll need to sign that document so that I can sign. Is that right? Or can Sarah still sign even though she's abstained? I need to check with um, town council. She's not. She hasn't voted, and the abstention will be noted in the decision. But um, I think as a chair, she can sign that the board move that forward. And the decision will state that she is staying. I think she's okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so you have to. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Karen Bennett, 28 Lincoln. Um, you didn't open at the meeting for additional comments that weren't on the agenda, and I wanted to see if I could do that. We're going to do that at the okay. end. All right. Um, but I will allow comment after each of the hearings separately. Okay. Um, if that helps. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'd like to move on to the continued public hearing for cell signaling. Um, if I could have a motion to reopen the hearing that was continued from our last meeting on their application for a special permit. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Have a vote. Uh, Mary? Yes. Here. Yes. 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 Sarah. Great. And now we need to do another roll call. Um, who's present for the hearing? Um, Mary Foley. Here. Peter I'm Morton. Here. I'm here. Sue Kilbert. I'm here. Chris Foley. Gordon Brewster. Here. Here. Penny. Sarah. Here. Great. Um, Should we get the applicants? Or yes. Uh, where's the applicants?
Yep, yeah, yeah, no, we had emailed, I um, guess there was a few different things that we received last week from the applicant. Um, just going back to our original July memo, um, one was additional information from Hancock Associates on um, temporary facilities, um, just limited to item 4.8, which is limits of clearing, so that we were comfortable with the information that was provided, um, that no additional clearing would be done for the temporary facilities. Um, we did get the link. Uh, there's a YouTube link for that under uh, item 6.1 of the view. Uh, so I know that has been a comment and concern from the planning board. Um, we do have an additional rendering from the applicant. Um, they've indicated that their review is not showing that the building would be visible, that they have adequate screening with evergreen trees. Uh, the rendering is just from two different locations, so it's not obviously the entire stretch of 128, so it's you know, we're relying on information from the applicant, but they did provide um, a YouTube video of additional information. Um, and then I, I don't know if Mark, you want to just flag, because we did get some additional conditions um, that might have changed sort of from the morning to this afternoon. Um, but I can speak to some which, of the, the sidewalk discussions. Which mark are you? Oh, sorry, um, Mark Resnick. Okay. Are you, Mark Resnick, are you able to go through those conditions? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, is, uh, I think you may want to have the applicant here to discuss the conditions. Um, can we go so, back? What document are we talking about? So, well, I'm just asking what document you're talking about. So, this uh, afternoon, late afternoon, uh, we received uh, proposed conditions from the applicant, which was emailed to us late this afternoon. So, you may not have seen it. So, okay. So, I had responded that I assume this was on next week, next meetings agenda since we haven't had time to review. Well, we'll continue to discuss it. Um, okay. Do you have an objection to continuing? Well, just that we just got it a half hour before the meeting. Absolutely. So, I mean, we can, I'm sure, brush over it, but I haven't had a chance to review it. And, and if we could get a link to the YouTube video, that would be good as well. If I may? Yes. Um, I did send everybody to uh, send Mark the link to the YouTube video for distribution. Uh, I also sent. Uh, I, we didn't get the proposed conditions until late Sunday afternoon yesterday. So. No, and I. That's fine. I'm just saying that we as a board need time to review it, and we never got the original. So if we could get the original as well, that would be good. Um, this is just the first we're seeing it. Okay, and, and I did because it's difficult sometimes discussing. Uh, the written materials without having them in front of you. I did make hard copies of the conditions with the exhibits for distribution of the planning board, yeah. if you'd like them. That would be great. Thank you, Mark. 
some commentary related to the traffic engineer's comments last week related to that Atwater Ave. Um, why don't we let uh, Mark Lovsky go through the conditions first? Okay, okay. sure. Sure, I, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, first of all, uh, late this afternoon I realized that the Finance Committee had actually also suggested a condition that's not included. And so that's uh, an additional condition that uh, we'd be happy to comply with. And that condition came in an email, and it was that uh, South Sigley developed a plan in consultation with police and fire chiefs to train all public safety personnel on the features and layout of their buildings to prepare them for any type of public safety response that may be needed. And that is something that's done with Beverly and Danvers as well by cell signaling. And so that, that could uh, well be a condition. And the, the Finance Committee did urge you to incorporate that uh, <coughs> when it reviewed the fiscal impact study. Yes. Uh, and so in addition to that, uh, what you've received from me in response to what I got yesterday from Mark Resnick is uh, a list of conditions that we think uh, would be appropriate in response to what we've heard. And I'm going to go through them very quickly, and if there's anything in particular that needs to be discussed, we can go back to it, or we can stop at each condition, however you prefer to do it. Well, why don't we go through them one by one, um, and I'd like to give Mark Resnick a chance to respond first before we hear from the board on each one. Sure. And, and before I get started, I should introduce Brian Goudreau, who's taken Matt Connor's place. Matt is no longer with Hancock. Uh, Brian is now uh, the engineer from Hancock, who's primarily responsible for this project. So Brian's caught up, and he's here with us tonight. Uh, the others that are here tonight are Chris Cohn, uh, Peter Godot, uh, Charlie Ware from Hancock, and Greg Keller somewhere behind me. Behind me. <laughs> oh, there you are. And uh, on uh, virtual, uh, virtually tonight is uh, Sam Gregorio from TEC. So we will collectively present the uh, conditions. Uh, the first condition uh, deals with uh, Mark Resnick's suggestion that we pay for a third party to uh, inspect on behalf of the planning board. And in response to that suggestion, uh, we reminded the planning board that this project is a controlled construction project. And uh, Greg Keller, if he, you would like, uh, will explain how controlled construction works. And uh, we will be complying with the cons controlled construction requirements. And obviously, the building inspector will be supervising the process. But Craig, could you give a little input? Yeah, sure. Craig Keller with Concrete Construction. Uh, most commercial properties, anything over 35,000 cubic feet, required what they call a registered design professional, uh, which is a licensed architect engineer who oversees the design and construction of a, of, of a property. Uh, they're licensed in the state of Massachusetts, and they have very specific requirements both to meet all of the uh, relevant codes and to uh, verify that the work going in place does indeed meet the uh, design intent of their drawings and at the end of the project. At the beginning of the project, they uh, provide an affidavit that says all of their design meets the Massachusetts State Building Code. Uh, they submit that for permit. It's a requirement for permit. And then at the end of the project, they do the same. They submit affidavits to the to the town that says the, the construction occurred in accordance with our plans and all co applicable codes. So that's what controlled construction is. It's a professional design engineer who oversees the project and design. So 
So that's that's why we quantified condition number one. And uh, obviously, between now and the next meeting, you, you can discuss that. And if there's anything additional that's required, uh, please let us know. Uh, the second condition dealt. If you could just hold on one second, Mark Resnick, did you want no. to chime in on condition one? Well, I still think there should be some site inspections by our engineer, just as uh, the building department still does. Even though there's an affidavit, they still do electrical, and fire department does fire code inspections, and the building inspector does his inspections and plumbing. So I, st uh, I still believe there should be uh, some sort of schedule of site inspections done for uh, for the uh, the installation of the drainage and some of the other significant site work. Can I add something to that for you too? Is there is there a schedule of special inspections have been listed? Is, there's no document said the structural engineer is going to be doing this or uh, are going out there. Uh, uh, is there a list of special inspections for geotechnical, for everything to kind of answer what Mark was just bringing up? There is. It has not been established for any of the building components. It, it's quite lengthy. Uh, yeah. you know, just an overview, for, let's just take structural as, a, as a, a small aspect. Not only does the structural engineer have to design, he also, in the owner page for this, they also have to do a third party review of his design. The peer review. A peer review, peer exactly. Review. So, so there's layers, and then what happens is part of his responsibility, the structural engineer's responsibility, is he has to identify independent third-party testing for work that's right. going in. So the owner then hires a third-party independent testing agency who witnesses concrete placement, steel placement, anything that is required under the structural engineer's testing program. And, and so any work that goes in has third party inspections. Those inspection reports go to the uh, structural engineer for review and approval. So just trying to actually, I'm actually trying to help you a little bit here. The, the idea that there will be a, a eventual list when the building starts to go into real construction, there'll be a list of inspectors, when, who, what, where, when, and how, and the communication with, with this is a question, but they'll be, in, they'll be in communication with our, the town's uh, inspectors as well. well. Yes, without a doubt. Even, even simple things like civil. The DPW usually has their own inspection program when we're putting in water or sewer. They want to be there for testing, third-party testing agencies for chlorination and, and pressure. So that's pretty standard operating procedure. In the town, the, the town plumbing inspector will be, uh, you know, have underground plumbing inspections very typical to residential, yeah. but it will be it will be identified, you know, through the, the permitting process. Okay, so that that process is yet to happen. Is what oh, you're yes, that's when we apply so, for the. Yeah, I'm going to ask if I may speak for Mark Resnick for a second here. The actual site that work that's ongoing right now. I know it's just drilling and blasting and such, but eventually it's going to be spreading earth and doing stuff on the site. A lot of stuff on there. Do you have somebody on site observing that? Uh, if there's any compaction tests to yes, be made? We okay. will. Yeah, we oh. will. And that will be, first off, there's what we call construction administration, which Hancock has the responsibility of doing uh, interval inspections. And then we will have a third party inspecting agency that will do compaction testing, proctors on the soils, and inspecting grades and soil placement. Okay. Mark, did that? Did that meet what you were looking for, a question? Well, no, I understand what their process is, um, but um, just uh, just as they provide those um, testing results to the other town inspectors, um, those other town inspectors do observe um, and are there uh, at various times, but there's nobody who's uh, on the behalf of the town doing site inspections. So um, that's when oftentimes planning boards require that their consulting engineer 
um, or if they have happen to have an inspector because they do a lot of stuff, um, uh, just uh, come in and do periodic inspections and write a report on uh, what they observe uh, out at the site. This is often the procedure uh, in subdivision situations where the developer is constructing roads and sidewalks and utilities that are ultimately going to be the responsibility of the municipality. And, and so that's a little different. This is, uh, in this case, the owner of the property is going to be responsible for all this stuff after completion of construction. So it's a little distinguishable, I think, from maybe situations that uh, Mark may be referring to. I'm not sure. No, you're, you're absolutely correct that for subdivisions, it's common practice for site uh, development. Some towns do it and some towns don't. Uh, most places I've been in, um, the major site elements uh, when they go on the ground are oftentimes uh, observed by uh, the town uh, uh, board's inspector or if the town has a, uh, or the board has an inspector uh, just to, uh, to ensure you know, like any other inspector, town inspector does. Sarah Creighton, I see you have your hand up. Thanks. <laughs> um, I think there are two things here. One is the the building itself, and I uh, that would be under. It seems to me that's under controlled construction. I'm not sure if controlled construction extends to the site work. Um, so I guess that's a question, um, and I think we're, I'm most concerned about the site work and the drainage being installed as design. Um, I think we reserve the right to have it inspected by a third party, and I think the question is who's going to pay for that. Um, we, the building itself, um, electrical, plumbing, all of that, it seems to me if there's additional inspectors needed beyond the building department or the plumber or the plumbing inspector, those expenses are covered by the building permit fee. Even though, uh, so I would disagree with the condition proposed by the finance committee that additional permit uh, review fees be um, required of cell signaling, at least for the building. But for the site, work, the drainage in particular, and any uh, compliance with any of these conditions on the road or, or off-site, um, it does seem that we should reserve the right to ensure that they are installed as designed. And I think that's consistent also with the idea of a performance bond, which is one of the later conditions, and, thus, and then subsequently it's release. We have to have some sort of validation that uh, the site work is installed as, as we have permitted or, or a modification based on site conditions has been agreed. Um, so I think there is some, probably Weston and Sampson, uh, work on the site issues that is outside of control, the control construction scope, but maybe you guys can clarify that for me. Sarah, did you want clarification from Mark Glowski and his team, or? Or from the applicants to what the control construction extends to site work. Did you get that? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're breaking up a little bit. I, 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 I understand your concern, and uh, I think that uh, Cell signaling uh, would be prepared to cover the cost of a third party review of those things that would be covered by the performance bond. If, if, if required. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. You, oh. No, no, I was going to change the subject for a second. <laughs> um, just two quick questions. Um, and I, I was, it's probably for um, our town planner, 
who on the town side is overseeing the project in its entirety? If we have an inspector here and an inspector there, who's see overseeing the whole project? And then my second question is, question slash comment is, I believe when the select board had discussions of not um, looking into having a full-time building inspector, it was because we were going to have um, large projects pay for the inspection services. So I'm wondering why that changed and where that changed. So maybe that's a question to the select board. But um, so those are my two questions. Uh, so, um, so yeah, the building department um, is responsible for the construction of the building which is why typically the planning board or the approving authority is responsible for overseeing the construction of the site. So oftentimes during uh, site construction, there are conditions that require field modifications, um, uh, you know, and uh, so if you have an inspector who's familiar with what's been going into the site, um, uh, you know, he can uh, make, uh, uh, you know, judgment calls uh, on what to do and uh, uh, how to adjust uh, whether to approve something or not. So, um, so that's why having an inspector and having the cost paid for by the applicant and you don't need to be there. Uh, well, let's say, for example, while they're spreading loam over some landscaping or while they're planting bushes, but while they're installing catch basins or they have a trench open and they have pipe in the ground to observe that, um, you know, those types of uh, things um, are typically what's uh, observed and usually they do a weekly construction uh, inspection or um, when, when active site work is, is going on and the drainage is being in, in, installed. Um, and so that's kind of the, uh, the control over construction of the site while the building department does the building. That wasn't what I expected to hear. The planning board is um, responsible for construction observation or administration. That doesn't seem right to me. There may be a third party inspection that uh, reports to the town. And the building inspector, typically the building department, has within its review of the building permit, it touches base with all the other departments that need to sign off prior to the building inspector, sign off on the building permit, and then same at closeout. So um, I just want to. I'm not trying to dispute what Mark said, but I want to clarify that I don't think the planning board is performing construction observation here. So if there is um, a bond that's required, performance bond for site observation, and the site development is what's in the planning board's purview, and I think we just need to talk about what's the right scope of independent third party um, review and or testing to ensure that the um, contract documents are fulfilled. And whether that's DPW or however DPW wants to manage it. With, with respect to the site, the site work, uh, bulk, the bulk of the site work is also covered by the order of conditions that the Conservation Commission issued. And they are going to be policing that during the course of construction because ultimately we're going to need to obtain a uh, certificate of compliance from the Conservation Commission. So there are multi-layers of inspection here. Agreed. I think on the certainly on the wetlands production and buffering wetlands and so forth, CONCOM is, um, is uh, that is within their jurisdiction. I think we're also talking about site utilities and um, ensuring that, um, you know, that the utilities are performed correctly. Has the DPW that weighed will, in at that all? That will be supervised by the DPW. Yeah, okay. So have they, have they, um, I don't mean to have Chuck a <laughs> I'm just asking a question of if Chuck has, has weighed in on how he thinks that this um, inspection or process should happen. Well, we've had regular meetings with, with Chuck and uh, did copy him on all this today. Uh, we anticipate that he will be inspecting those things. Uh, I don't know what more we can say at this point. But I think what you need to do between now and the next meeting is confirm all this and determine if you're satisfied, you've got a comfort level 
we don't we're not trying to avoid scrutiny. Uh, we just don't want to create extra work and extra fees. Yeah. Yeah. I just have a follow to that. I would um, request that we ask the um, DPW director and the building inspector to our next meeting so we can get a clear understanding of who's inspecting what. Mark, did you want to okay. talk, um, Mark Resnick, do you want to yep. talk a bit about your conversation with DPW now, or do you want to wait until we get a little bit further along on the conditions? Um, I think you probably want to talk about that when we get to the appropriate condition. Um, but yes, I did meet with Chuck um last week about much of the the work that we didn't discuss like on-site inspections um so uh that's a conversation i'm going to have to follow up with him um to see what they're willing to do uh, as far as on-site in inspections um of site work i don't believe that they anticipated they would do that, but I can certainly have that conversation with them. Great. Any other comments from the board on this condition before we move on to the next one? Just ask the question, are we asking um, Weston and Sampson to weigh in either now or later on how these conditions Yes. on their opinions and how these conditions also might be um, achieved if they answer peer review advice on that. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure they have seen these and haven't had a chance to, to respond. really yeah. respond. Um, they weren't copied. We, yeah, we do have them, so the yeah, market shared them um, with us. Um, yeah, certainly our contract with the town just for the planning board's assistance and technical review includes site plan special permits and plan phase as well as the construction phase as needed and desired and requested by the planning board. Um, so it certainly can support the town if that's desired, but certainly other town departments at the DW um, or others are going to be reviewing stormwater controls and diversion controls and the like. We don't need to be on site um, during construction, so it's, yeah, it's really up to the planning board on that first condition um, and the level of comfort. Uh, but yeah, I think as Mark mentioned, the most would be, there would be weekly um, for the active construction and site civil work, but um, again, it's like the direction of the town. Did you have a chance to um, review these so that you're comfortable commenting on them today? Um, we have seen them. I mean, it was just today that we saw the initial comments. So we kind of have like end up technical review, but we do. Uh, some of them are tied to the applicant's information that was provided last week. Um, specifically on Atwater Ave and uh, School Street and the, the roadway improvements. So we do have our traffic engineers so we can respond to questions from the board related to those items. Um, I guess I'm trying to figure out if you would be more comfortable waiting till our next hearing to respond before our next hearing, um, or are you comfortable weighing in today? It, it may still be useful just to, I mean, there's, there's 14 conditions. I mean, if the board was open to it, it would be good to just talk through them. And the ones that are are clear and resolved, we can um, move forward with those. But if there are ones that require more technical review, those could be continued. Um, just so we do have enough time to weigh in if there's still open technical questions. And that, that way we'd make progress tonight. Does that seem agreeable to the board? Yes. Okay. That would be helpful. Um, why don't we go on to number two then? That starts out hours of construction. 
in, in this vein, I think that uh, some of the members of the public who are here tonight may be here because of the blasting question. And, and uh, I don't know, I think that's and, and rather than ask them to sit through 14 conditions, perhaps we could take a break from this. It's somewhat related to hours of construction and talk about uh, the blasting uh, questions that have come up uh, so that maybe if people don't want to spend their entire night here, uh, they, they could hear what they came to hear. Is that, would that be okay? Is that agreeable to the board? I think that's very yes. reasonable. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think to, to start this discussion off, I, I would reintroduce uh, Greg Keller from Columbia, who was supervising the blasting and who has been intimately involved. And uh, uh, he can perhaps explain what's happened to date, what's anticipated. And uh, I know the fire chief is here as well. So with plenty of people who know more about blasting than I do, I'm going to step aside. OK. Um, as you all know, we are starting blasting procedures at the site. Uh, we anticipate uh, a, a blast every day. A blast is usually uh, we drill anywhere from 24 to 50 holes. And uh, very controlled, usually about 3,000 square feet a day. It's one blast that lasts all of a millisecond. Uh, we usually spend, you know, two days to set up for one blast. Uh, it's a very controlled. Uh, it's not wide open blasting. All blasting is covered by a series of mats. Actually, we're double covering mats. It's supervised anytime explosives are on site. <coughs> Uh, the fire department has a detail on site. Uh, we are required by uh, law and code to uh, get permitting. The fire department's issued the permit. Uh, and there is a blasting plan that meets all of the uh, uh, requirements in the state of Massachusetts. We've set up uh, seismometers uh, according to the code, which is anywhere within 250 feet of the blasting area, and we've actually set up uh, remote seismometers over on Mill Street and up on School Street just to verify uh, the level of vibration that anyone can be feeling at any time. Um, we're well within the parameters of uh, the criteria for blasting. And Chief, you're the authority having jurisdiction. And yeah, so a little bit, of, I think there's been some conversation about the permitting process. Uh, so basically, the way the permitting process works on the fire department side, we review a detailed blasting plan. We look at past actions on the blast or a blasting company. We look at, you know, obviously valid licenses, etc. Uh, the one thing that does tie back to our bylaws, if they're removing more than 250 cubic yards of uh, fill, then that triggers a planning board review of the uh, blasting permit, which they're leaving everything on site, so that does not trigger that. Our details been up there. I get a uh, daily blasting report from not only just the blaster itself, but from each of the uh, devices that are monitoring the vibrations and sound. None of those have, uh, some have triggered, which a trigger doesn't mean that it's outside of the acceptable range. It just means it acts, the device sends something. So it's important to remember that the devices are kind of calibrated, so they're they're not going to just catch a vehicle driving down the road and trigger. So there's a, a lower threshold for the trigger, and there's a higher threshold for the trigger. Um, I think as of this point, point one has been the highest trigger that we've had out of the, what's it been, two weeks-ish, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and the safety threshold starts at point five. Um, so we're well below um, what there is. Myself or other firefighters have also been on Mill Street uh, pretty much every single day that they've been blasting since the complaints have been coming up and monitoring uh, kind of the conditions on Mill Street as well. And nothing is um, kind of out of the ordinary that we wouldn't expect. Before we hear from the public, anything comes on board? Mary. I have some questions. Um, so, and thank you, Chief. I got the blasting permit this afternoon. Um, just, a, I guess, a housekeeping question. No, I can't find the permit. Um, it says for eight water, eight, 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 at water bath. Yes. Um, and I know our application is for two, 
at water ebb. So is the blasting happening at the MAC site? So the blasting is happening at two. However, our systems hadn't updated with the assessor's database with a new address. So the closest address we had uh, to the permit was eight. Um, so that's why it has eight, and it has been, once the assessor's database connects with our database, we don't have an address in our system yet uh, for two. And that's why it is a state. So is that, is, I mean, the state allows that to have an incorrect address? Yeah, so I, we have a note on the permit, the, the blasting, and then the blasting detail has a map, a uh, map based upon what the blasting has occurred. Okay. Yep. Um, and then you mentioned the 250 cubic yards, um, which is our, for our general bylaw. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I think within the last three years, um, a resident petition to have that new section for blasting added to that. Um, I don't know that it was specifically requested to add to earth removal because the, the blasting portion is a little, um, doesn't really match up with the earth removal part. Mm -hmm. They're kind of separate things. I don't know that the bylaw reads if then how type of thing. Um, so um, it, and it definitely doesn't read that it has to be 250 cubic yards removed from the blasting. It's just if the 250 cubic yards is going to be removed from site. So I guess I would just want to verify with self signaling that with the roughly two acres of trees and shrub that you're removing and things like that, the soil. So you don't think you'll be with any of your construction removing 250 no. cubic yards? No. Okay. Um, and then my only other comment with that is that our general bylaw blasting hours are different than our construction hours. So when we get back to that, the conditions, um, we'll have to talk about the hours because they don't match up, and, and there's no wiggle room in the general bylaws for hours, construction hours. Um, and, and I am curious to hear from residents because I know there's been a lot of concern with um, the blasting and the vibrations and the integrity of homes. And so I think people were hoping that that general bylaw would kick in because they would have been notified a quarter of a mile and so more people would have been aware of what's going on so maybe we can get some feedback from the residents and understand what their concerns are anyone else from the board before we take public comment I just have a couple of um, logistic questions regarding the blasting so um, the area where you're be blasting and you are blasting currently is it as it sits on the site is it um, are you beginning with those blasts that are closest to Mill Street and working away from it? Is there a strategy around that? Or is it, does it, what is your, what is your plan there? And my, my the question is because if you're ending up closer to Mill Street, does that mean that the intensity of the blast will increase as you go? That's a good question. It, it's not linear. Um, Blasting is, is an art form, it's actually computer uh, generated. So you're always looking for a, a relief point of blasting. So the early blasts that we did were test blasts the first week. There was no relief. We we're essentially blasting straight down the ground. As we start to work into the cliff, now all of that energy has a release and can move, move sideways. There is uh, all the blasting that has taken place so far has been on the lower area, and we've created relief for that lower area. We're actually moving next week to start the drilling in the upper area. Now, the upper area will have two different types of, of blasting techniques. One will be literally drilling every two feet. Like if you go up on 128, you'll see the scarified. Well, that relieves the rock and allows all that energy to push the rock away from what you're, you're remaining. So that you'll have some vibration, but not nearly if you're directly in the ground. There is a little bit of uh, blasting that has to happen in the up, what we call the upper meadow area, but that will also have relief and it's very, very shallow 
uh, like five feet at the most. Yes. Uh, then there's there's one other area that requires blasting that's probably closest to the residents, and that is probably a couple days of blasting for the water line that's in the in the uh, the roadway, the ring roadway along the uh, southern side. <clears throat> So if I understand that correctly, and I'm, science is not my strong suit here, but does that, it sounds to me like as you go on, you relieve pressure, which means that the vibrations could be less on Mill Street. Am I hearing that correctly? They could be, but I, I don't anticipate. I think where we're, why we did a week of test blasting is to see, you know, size of charge, how the rock breaks, et cetera, et cetera. So I would anticipate that the level that we're achieving right now will be pretty static going going forward. Thank you. you know, you may have one or two that has, you know, a, a different vibration signal, but you also may have some that are, are negligible. So rock is a, an interesting thing, and that's why I have experts that do that. <laughs> okay, thank you. from the board. Mark Resnick, do you want to comment on this issue before I take public comment? Uh, no. I think uh, <laughs> they've explained what they're doing quite clearly. So. Um, so I can tell that people are tuned in. There are quite a few people in the room and there are also quite a few people online. Um, and I want to give everyone a chance to be heard who wants to speak, so I'm going to have to ask folks to be concise and efficient um, and keep it to a couple minutes so that everyone does get a chance to be heard. Um, so we'll start, I think, with the folks in the room. Um, if you want to just raise your hand if you'd like to be heard. Karen, Karen Bennett. Bennett. Yeah, Karen Bennett, 28 Lincoln Street. Um, I am questioning are there any plans to look at the homes that are close to um, the site? Because when we built the high school, all the homes that abutted the high school had damage and the town ended having to settle with those folks. So are, is there any plans to put structural engineers into the homes that are closest to to see what their damage is before and after? With the high school, what they did is they didn't send them before, they sent them after the fact. And they were at our houses for like eight hours at a time. So I'm just curious, um, what are we doing to protect the homes and the people in that area? Anyone else? Just raise your hand. <clears throat> oh, I'll start. John Abbott, 13 Mill Street. Uh, I've been there for uh, 48 years, and we have got to have a history of last week in that area, as some of you may recall, and some of you may not, but it was pretty severe uh, building out that uh, gravel pit. And indeed, uh, our concerns at that time uh, fell on deaf ears. And as a matter of fact, uh, I, I attended many um, select persons' meetings, and I was actually told once that, well, that's just fist trucks going up 128, which is a completely irresponsible answer from a public uh, elected official. Um, Sue Thorne was on that board at that time, and she came to our house and sat at our dining room table. <coughs> and the blast went off. Boom! <coughs> and she said, oh yeah. <coughs> and, you know, if you don't get out and into the houses, as uh, Ms. Bennett said, <coughs> you, you know, you don't know. You're working in a vacuum. Um, but one of the things that really bothers me, even though the bylaw may not be clear, is that we were never informed. Matter of fact, um, I really didn't know that a blast was going to happen uh, until I saw all the birds start flying in the air before, before it happened. I said, oh, what? okay, then the blast. And it does shake the house, and I'm not close like Liz is and, and, and these other people. Um, it does shake, it does rattle, and, and it could be, it is traumatic to some people. Uh, it doesn't seem to bother me as much, but I'm sure that other people do. And it, 
But we should know when it's going to happen, and we should know the severity of it. Uh, so the communication here um, has been lacking and uh, should be improved on in some way to communicate with the neighbors when this is going to happen and what the severity of it is and the hours of it. Um, you know, I'm an early riser, but that doesn't mean everybody is. And I know these, I think today was about quarter or twelve. I was in my cellar, and oh, <clears throat> I mean, if I were a combat marine, I would have jumped under the table. <laughs> so, this is not uh, this is not a minor issue. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who is present in the room? Could you just say your name and your address? Sure, I'm Jeff Conley, 28 Mill Street, uh, right around the corner from this. You mentioned before that we haven't gotten the closest yet to Mill Street. That will be coming in a couple of weeks. Um, if we haven't gotten close, if we haven't gotten to that point yet, that's the closest. I had pictures fall off the wall on day right. two. So if we're not there yet, what's what's coming? You know, what's the what's the severity that's coming? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, the picture didn't break, landed on a carpet, no big deal. I fire chief came over immediately, which was great, um, and we had, we had a good chat. But um, it sounds like it's going to get worse. Excuse me, so this is Gail. Yes. Um, I could not hear that last person who was speaking, and it would really be helpful if people stood up and projected because the microphone is in the middle of the room. Okay. When you're sitting on the back bench, you can't hear you. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks for that. Well, I don't know who yeah. spoke. Okay, that was Jeff Connolly, 12 Mill Street. Oh, I'm sorry, 28. I'm sorry. It's great. I live around the corner, so I <laughs> Um, so, as Gail said, in order to be recorded and picked up, Gail prepares the minutes. Um, so if you could stand up, um, then she'll be able to hear you, excuse me, and um, make sure we get your comments correctly. Anybody else uh, want to speak who's in the room? Um, can you, uh, sorry, Karen Bennett, 28 Lincoln. Um, what are the blast, the drilling hours or construction hours in the bylaws and the blasting in the bylaws and um, what hours are they for both of those? I don't think that's clear to everyone here um, and what the, what they're asking for is an exception on, in both categories. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Keith Moore is uh, 71 Forest Street. Uh, one, one question to the bylaws in terms of the monitoring device. What's the procedure if that goes over the, the uh, 0.5 threshold? Anybody else? Ian Hogan, I'm at uh, 23 Mill. And he had mentioned that so, so did far. You stand up? I'm he really had mentioned sorry. so far that he had only reached 0.1, was it? Oh, okay. Or is it going to go over that? Is it going to go over 0.1? And how will we know? I can't, first off, I'm, I'm not the licensed blaster. I'm speaking for our, our company. Uh, I will check with, with them. Every blast is different, uh, number of charges, uh, location, etc. Our goal has always been to stay within that threshold. That's why we do some of the test blasts to see and monitor all, all across. So, uh, I, as I said before, I can't guarantee, but our threshold is, is 0.5 at any point, well, even at the even at the closest. I like guess none back. of us want to see it get to 0.5. None of us. <laughs> no, okay. no, so no, I, I just want to clarify yeah. that we're not going to go there. We're not going to get to 0.5. We're not going to get over 0.1. Because I felt it shake on Thursday, and it was pretty scary for us. And I guess our concern, again, is what point... Are you going to keep it? Are you going to try to keep it under 0.1? We always endeavor to keep it as low as possible. Okay, you right. endeavor to, but can you? I, I, I can't guarantee it right now, but the state code requires us to stay under 0.5. So yes. Because 0.5 scares me. It, and I think everybody in this room. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of documentation out that we've shared with the chiefs and with, with other people about even what 0.5 is. Um, I, and again, I'm more than happy to share 
a lot of the documentation about yeah. how how it's registered, what it feels like. What you feel in a house is different than if you're standing outside your house. Because yeah. it's, it's sort of harmonic. And I will be the first to admit that if you're in your house, you feel a lot more than if you're yeah. standing next well, to your house. Well, I came up and touched you. You, yes. you were very right. kind and you yes. mentioned that. Um, um, but I guess there was one blast in particular. Uh, I think most of them I've been okay with. There was one blast in particular, I believe it was Thursday, that um, shook my house probably was the one that had your paintings and stuff yeah. falling off. I'd like to know what that blast registered. Okay, if you can yeah. give me the exact date that she okay, has well, all the Thursday. information. This was past it, Thursday? It really, it was, I'm pretty sure it was Thursday. Okay. Because that's, you know, the first week, and I think I explained this to you, yeah. was our test blasting to see how the rock properly leaves and they use different charges. Now that they have, a, you know, a process going, we're, we're seeing the same values right now across the board. So, so we anticipate we're not just going to suddenly overcharge anything. So. And, and I, I want to answer someone else's question. We do have a, a process, uh, and you see me after this, or that we have a, a text alert that every day will text and give up like a I'm 40. Not on. I'm not on. You don't know when they're happening. And now okay. I realize that's what I heard today in yeah. the last. And I didn't know what happened to my neighborhood. Okay. I will make sure, I, I don't know how to communicate it, but we'll make sure that. Um, we communicate through a, a text. I think Liz, you're on it, right? I am, right. but I know that other people have tried to get on it. I'm you're the only one who's, who's contacting me. Again, it's our, our blaster notifies anybody who's on it to a text alert that will give you. It's usually about a 45 minute uh, window because you've got to set the charge, you've got to check the charges, and all that. So every day there is, yeah, if you would, it'd be great. Every day, there's an alert that goes out that says, you know, expect a blast at, at you know, Atwater Ave at this time. So, Within a 45 yeah, minute window. Right, yes. So that you're prepared. Can the data be made public daily? It can be, yeah. I mean, because if we're, if we're not home, if we're traveling, right. we're away, yeah. you know, we might not know to, to check our foundation or to look around. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's pretty technical. So I mean, there's 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 velocities, there's you know PPV. There's, I think the number, I don't I know think how the to number read is all we are kind right. of interested. Yeah, in. you're just looking at the, the velocity, which is the, the point box. Mm -hmm. So um, we can certainly publish that. That'd be great. Yeah. So as a correction, just um, I pulled up. I, like I said, I get the reports every day and go through all of them to make sure nothing's even getting close to the point five. On Thursday, uh, which was in question, uh, it was it, one was point two, the other uh, four sensors, nothing triggered. Uh, so the highest was point two. I just went back through the, all of the the reports. Okay. So that would make sense why Thursday um, was, was was more significant. Can I answer a couple of questions before yes, we get please. too too far and yeah. then we forget? Yeah. Um, so house evals. Um, anybody that, stand up too? Yep. Sorry. Uh, so for our house evaluations, or they call them pre-blast surveys, they're only required within 250 feet. Um, the contractor has gone out and offered them. Uh, only one resident has um, accepted a pre-blast survey to this state. Uh, within that, so so with the uh, offered as in, if you would ask for one, you would get. Let me, let me, let me rephrase. So. Um, the notifications, we covered that with the text blast, it's within a 45 minute, uh, half hour to 45 minute window, mm -hmm. depending on, um, for the hours, we'll obviously you'll clarify the hours, the only thing that is in the blasting um, regulation of the permit uh, applicant that was applied to me is if they're within a 250 foot buffer of 128, then there is a time constriction of 10 to 2, um, so that is in what um, I allowed. And then if the if it goes over the threshold, so somebody said, well, what happens if it gets to 0. 0.5? So automatically by state law, uh, they have to notify me, and we also notify the state fire marshal's office uh, to do an evaluation as well. So they come in, the state comes in basically, and um, 
puts a magnifying glass and whatnot again. So that's kind of a process. Um, just one more question. Who watches the gas lines coming yes. into our houses as well? So the amount of vibrations going in at 0.5 is well below anything that's going to hit any like water lines in the street, gas lines. Those aren't the things that, you know, even get close to that. You'd be three times that before that became an issue. So how do we get the pre-blast survey? Yeah. How How do does that work? That? There's a, there's a uh, list going around. Just put your address on there. And it's a third party. We don't even control it. We'll contact a third party that will contact you and make the arrangements. Is there any been 10, 12 blasts? The yeah. pre-blast yeah. isn't really. And I yeah. did. I think you were talking about me when you mentioned a resident getting a pre-blast survey, and I did. But that was that wasn't before blasting began. I had asked for and got it. And I don't mean to interrupt you. But we don't, all of us don't know who all of you are. So if oh, you okay. could just say Elizabeth your name. Elizabeth Thomas, 27 Elm Street. <laughs> thank you. And stand yeah. up. Stand up. Yeah. Thank oh, you. God. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I just, I feel like you were talking about me, you know, that I was the resident that got the pre-blast survey. Mm -hmm. I do know Dr. Gurley also got one right after me. But pre-blast surveys are supposed to be before blasting begins. That's the pre part. And <laughs> mine didn't wasn't done till ten blasts in. And if if I had gotten notification prior, which by the way, my notification was two strange men coming to my door at seven thirty in the morning knocking. One of them was at my door, the other one was already in my backyard putting down a black case that I had no idea what it was. That was my notification. That's not okay. No, like, no, we deserve it, better oh, than that. Yeah. <laughs> and I definitely deserve it. I live close enough that you wanted to put a seismograph on my property. So I live close enough that I should have gotten notification in, in advance. And I did get that pre-blast survey. But my neighbor, Jeff Conley, he also has a seismograph. And he didn't get that offer. So, I mean, to say there is a lack of communication is putting it extremely kindly, which I had actually sent all of you a letter earlier today, an email. Yeah, I saw it. And so that kind of broke down all of my concerns because I really don't want to be public speaking right now. <laughs> well, your letter was very good. Okay, mm -hmm. that's much all, more my all forte. All very well. <laughs> I will step down now. Thank you for taking the time to write it. Does anybody else want to make a point? Yeah. It's Josh Rogers, 50, um, sorry. Josh Rogers, 59 Forest Street. Um, this is not technically about blasting, but there's a lot of you know, spray painted lines on our street now, and it seems like this is the beginning of a very big project. And I would just like to know what is the plan and what is the impact gonna be? So yeah. how, how would we know that? That might be more appropriate for DPW. I'm not sure, do you yes. want to take a uh, crack? Uh, that is the extension of sewer and water lines okay. that are going to be going from Summer Street up Forest Street, Mill Street, under 128. Okay. Uh, that project was funded by a MassWorks grant of $3,500,000 that was obtained by the town. And the work, as I understand it, is going to commence in September. Okay. And uh, and what so I how would we what I further this? understand about that is that no blasting will be required on Forest Street and Mill Street. Okay. That the conditions are such is that, that to support CST or is that for some it, other reason? It's it's not only for CST but it's for other properties in the limited commercial district. For instance, the new DPW headquarters is going to get water and sewer from that project. Well, in general, I don't know who to direct this to. It would be nice if people would communicate what the plans are. They're going to, you know, impact wide swaths of residents, which sounds like for either months or maybe years. I, I think that the uh, town administrator does a pretty good job in that department. Uh, he's not here. He is. Right. He's, he's right. He's, right he's, he's on the screen, screen behind you. Oh, and I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm anxious so, to comment. I didn't realize that, but but generally, Greg uh, is pretty good in the cricket. I, I read it all the time that he advises the community as to what's going on. So we all better buy the cricket. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I read the cricket, but I, I yeah, there's a lot of people here tonight that don't know what's going on. Well, so I'm not saying that's your well, issue, but it's... That, that's a DPW question, and I think Chuck Dam is the best okay. to address that. 
Trey, did you want to uh, add anything at this point? So, um, you know, as, as, as hard as we try to do communications, it's never enough because there's always someone who hasn't heard it. Um, but we will be giving notification. PPW will be notifying people directly um, along the path of those two pipes um, as that time gets closer. And how will so that happen? And when will that happen? So the project will likely begin um, in, in September sometime. Construction will actually begin at that point. Um, and there'll be notifications typically through door hangers. So there'll be door hangers, there'll be the use of the uh, road signs, you know, notifications. I'll continue to do updates on my blog, which you can get online. Um, and the DPW will be communicating um, with, with residents along the route. Um, Dan Daly up on Forest Street, right, right next to my friend right there. But look at uh, Forest Street is a dangerous street, regardless of what they want to do digging up this road. The, uh, the sidewalk is not passable, it's not safe. This project should be going down another road, not Forest Street. I don't think anybody here wants that mess. And they'll be there. If he's starting in September, he won't be done through probably, who knows when it'll be done, but it'll be a long time in my estimation. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so Liz Thomas again. <laughs> that guy. Uh, um, so a couple years ago, probably maybe three, four years ago. Do not um, know who's talking. Oh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth okay. Thomas, 27 Mill Street. Um, I have spoken to the Board of Health, Ellen Lufkin, um, a couple times over the years, asking if sewer would ever be an option on Mill Street. And I was, because I have septic and I would have loved to have sewer. And um, I was told at that time, I don't remember the specifics on it, but it wouldn't be a possibility because of our brook. It'd be a risk with ground groundwater and contamination and all of that, that it would never happen on Mill Street. And now it's happening. So why is it okay now? Why is it safe for us to have sewer running down Mill Street when it wasn't previously? Does anyone else want to make a comment on the blastings here? I just I just want to stand up and get uh, her name. My name's Mary Bannon. I'm 25 Mill Street. I'm right next to Liz. Um, how are you protecting our houses with this pre-blasting? You know, I can, I contacted a surveyor and he said, you know, you're past the radius. But we're all worried about what I just put new tile floors all through the house. I'm afraid of them cracking. You know, so how are we going to register for this uh, pre-blasting? On the list you have right there. So all of us are going to get one? You will contact you, your choice. Yeah, my choice is yes. <laughs> um, Excuse me, may I intervene? Hello. Who? Hello? Who? My name is Hannah Osborne, and I'm, I just want to, uh, I don't want to um, cut you off, but I want to finish with the people who are in the room first. Um, okay, it's just that I'm in Switzerland, which is uh, right now it's 1:45 in the morning. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> if oh, you that's don't mind, <laughs> can I interject? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So as I said, my name is Tana Osborne. Uh, I grew up on 10 Ledgewood Road. About 40 years ago, my parents and my family uh, were friends with Liz's parents and baby Liz Thomas. And um, we went through hell because of the blasting on Atwater Ave. Um, all of our health was impacted. Our home was impacted. And I want to know why 40 years later, it's starting up again. Why is there blasting going on again on Atwater Ave? Why are the people on Mill Street, Forest Street, Ledgewood Road, 
Summer Street and all around School Street. Why, why are they being subjected to this again? Because 40 plus years ago, my parents and Liz's parents, and I believe the gentleman who is seated to Liz's left, were all dealing with this. We went to court. There was, there, it, it, it was horrific. And I want to know why this is happening again. Why Liz Thomas, who would wake up screaming from the blasts, is now being subjected to this again as an adult. And then uh, just May I sure. just wanted to, uh, I was there 40 years ago too, and uh, yeah. I, I was very much aware of what was going on at the quarry, and it was yeah. an entirely different kind of blasting operation, and it, uh -huh. was, it wasn't controlled the way this current project is being controlled, and I do understand that it was out of control in the 19, late 70s and 80s. And uh, it shouldn't have been, and uh, it's not. It, it's not a problem that we're responsible for, and we're doing everything we can to make sure that the consequences of that kind of activity don't recur. Anyone else um, want to make a comment? Who's here in the room? Um, okay. Just, but I do want to give everyone Jeff, a chance. Just one final question: okay. Who do we contact if there's damage? Responsible for it. If there's damage, you uh, there's a form that's on the fire department website that you can access. You and it goes to me and the state fire marshals, and they come out and do an evaluation. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be done within 30 days of the damage, though. So uh, you need to go. And out. you need to have inspected before the blast to know whether the damage is from the blast. So if you haven't done preliminary examinations of all of the houses within beyond the 250 yard or whatever radius. I mean, houses, Manchester and all of North Shore is built on ledge. It's built on granite. When you set it off a blast, it sets off the equivalent of sound waves, okay? So, and it's not just releasing the sound waves that are, that are impacting houses miles away. It's also releasing gases that have been trapped for millions of years in that rock. People around Herald Street and, and Liz's mother, people have died of cancer. We cannot, after the fact, know that it was definitely that. But Heather Michalowski, her mother and her father all had Cancer. Heather died a year ago at 51. Her father died the year we were graduating from high school, 88. Her mother had cancer while we were in high school. You. you cannot continue to let this blasting happen. It's, it's, I'm going to use a bad word. I've been living in Switzerland for 32 years, and this is still affecting me. I left Manchester because of how I was treated, because of how my family was treated during that whole episode. And you're doing it again, and you're treating the population like idiots. I'm sorry, but the guy who said it's all complicated, it's very complicated, no, it's not. It's vibrations just like the ones that you're hearing right now. Thank you for um, taking the time to call in from Switzerland. I appreciate it. Um, One more word. 40 uh, years ago, I, I, the last really, was I supposedly, think, wait a minute, no, let me finish, off, let me finish. Really, 40 really, years ago, it was supposedly to put in a, a, a strip mall or something like that. What is the excuse now? What is the excuse for blasting now? Are you really going to put in some buildings this time? It's been 40 years. I'm sorry, but I, I am going to move on to other people who would like to speak. Um, there are several people um, online with their hands raised. Uh, Greg, did you want to comment quickly before I go to other members of the public? 
or was that a hand raised from before? Um, th thank you, Susan. I would just comment that um, the water and sewer lines have been fully permitted, including conservation commission review. Um, so that uh, issues related to water and stream crossings and et cetera have all been reviewed and, and permitted um, by the appropriate boards. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, so, Lori Worth, I see your hand is raised. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Lori Worth. I live at 17 Mill Street. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, is my house within the range um, for which I would be eligible for a pre-blast survey? And if it is, I would like to have that done at my house. My next question is, um, I'd like to know about the damage to the houses um, that was mentioned earlier by Ms. Bennett when the high school construction was done. What type of damage did the houses there um, incur and how is that mitigated by the town? And thirdly, I'd like to hear what risk um, are we at in terms of our houses um, in terms of what kinds of damage we may experience from the blasting. Thanks. Anyone else? Um, don't see any other hands raised. Uh, Liz, did you want to make one more comment? Please I did. stand up. Uh, Elizabeth time. Thomas, 27 Mill Street. Um, kind of wanted to connect what Karen had mentioned about the drilling a ledge and also what Hannah had mentioned with back in the 80s. So back in the 80s, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, I don't remember any of it. Mm -hmm. I was a tiny baby <laughs> and I really don't remember. But um, I do know that that project, um, it stopped at blasting and never went beyond that. So we never reached the drilling on ledge stage. And I know that the, the high school area had a lot of significant mm -hmm. damage to fireplaces, and foundations and all sorts of problems uh, from drilling on ledge. Here on Mill Street and in Forest Street, we're gonna have both. So we're getting the blasting now, soon it's gonna be transitioning over to drilling on ledge. That's a one-two punch on our homes. So I'm not gonna lie, I'm the closest house. I'm worried, I'm very worried about how that's gonna play out, especially for the length of time that this is going on for, that's all. Um, self signaling or chief, did either of you want to make any other comments you know, based on what you've heard? Yeah, I mean, just in closing, um, you know, remember I'm, I'm an advocate for the residents. I, I serve you as your fire chief, um, so I'm constantly monitoring the blast. I do listen to concerns and not falling on deaf ears. Um, the safety margins that are imposed are because of things that happened in the 80s and those practices of severe damage to houses. Um, so those are things that we don't take lightly. Um, we are monitoring them, and like I said, it's as, as disruptive as it is, it's being done as safe man as possible. I'm never going to allow something that I feel is unsafe to affect one of the residents here. Sorry, okay, one, one more. Josh Stand Rogers, up. 59 Forest. Thank you. Um, Quickly. Does it make sense to stop the blasting till yeah. we do the pre-blast surveys so that people can get at least as appropriate a baseline as possible? Mm -hmm. That would be yes, one, it does. Before and after. Yeah, one yeah. question. Second question would just be, what? so a, a lot of statements that are fairly technical about how we're following regulations, and that I appreciate that, but my assumption is that regulations were followed when they built the high school and it seems to have caused a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. We're not doing a lot of lessons learned about what happened with high school, and so that's a concern, I think, for everybody here. Um, but but I think pausing the blasting and getting a baseline so we can properly measure these things seems like it would be a reasonable thing. Even if I was running CST, I might want that because you're opening yourself up to significant litigation. Uh, Sarah. Oh, I'd just like to clarify that the high school is a totally different project. Um, the issue there was compaction. We did not blast. There was no blasting in the high school. Okay. Thank you. Mary? Um, I thank you for saying that because I was going to try to throw that out there, what we could do with ensuring that the residents that want the pre-blast, and not pre-blast now, but um, a somewhat pre-blast survey done before further blasting happens. Um, 
And then I know the town administrator said that CONFOM reviewed for the sewer lines. Um, I think it would behoove the town and, and or the board at this point to also get the Board of Health um, input on it since Elizabeth had mentioned that the Board of Health was the one that was saying that it couldn't happen in prior years. And then my third question is to CST and or the fire chief. Um, is any blasting occurring within 250 feet of 128? Because I know you would need to then get a permit from the Mass DOT. Um, <clears throat> and there's regulations that need to happen on the highway. I don't know if the vibrations can be felt on the highway, but I know they have that 250 foot requirement as well. So just wondering where that falls. Yeah, um, a permit has been applied for. There is some minor blasting that happens within that 250 foot uh, perimeter. And so our blasting company has applied to the state for approval on that. The hours change. Uh, I think blasting is what, between 10, 10, and 10 to 2. 10 to 10 to 2. Um, and, and no blasting will occur until they receive that permit from the state. Okay, and then you'll let the planning board know when that occurs. Yeah, once 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 the um, permit is issued, then we will schedule very specific times within that that time frame that state allows. And does the state? Uh, this is just from the state websites. Does the state require that there's a pause on 128 of traffic during the blast? They do what they call a ro rolling roadblock. So they'll just. Probably at 1:33, they'll they'll put a couple cruisers out just sort of go slow, and they'll time it with with the blasting so that there are no cars in the immediate perimeter. Okay. So they, they don't do a full shutdown of the road. Okay. So there's one more um, person I didn't see online, and that's Sarah Pierce. Um, you want to go ahead, Sarah? Yes, thank you very much, Sarah Pierce, Nine Friend Street. Um, so a couple of questions and a comment. It sounds like right now um, we're in the preliminary stages of blasting. There's one blast being done per day. It sounds it's like it's in a 45-minute block. When you start doing your actual AVID construction, how many blasts will happen per day and what will the time frame be? I'd also like to make a comment. Um, I think as far as a resident, as I mentioned, I don't live on Mill Street, but there's been very little communication that any blasting in Manchester has been done. We have a flashing, blinking light at the end of the highway that lets residents know about a festival by the sea. I think that would be more useful if we could let residents know that there's active blasting going on in our town just in case. Locations like the MAC or any other places need to be uh, made aware of that. Um, I think that was it, but I, I do really feel badly for the people that live in that immediate area, especially those that have gone through this in the past. And we don't really know, as you said, rock is an unknown area, whatever the um, consultant had said, we don't really know what the impacts will be until the project starts. So those are my questions and comments. If we could get more. Great. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for taking the time to come and um, let us know what's happening in your neighborhood and how you're feeling about it all. Um, is it possible just to get an answer on the blasting of what will happen when you're in your avid state of beyond the one per day? Will it be all day blasting? Oh, no. No, we are actually into production right now, and currently it's the appears that only one blast will occur per day. Uh, and just so the other thing I forgot to mention uh, is the area is secure and then by state law we, uh, we, we ensure that the blaster sends out an air horn blast, a certain blast uh, five minutes out, one minute out from the blast, 
and you can hear that at least 250 feet. Once in a while, if the wind's blowing correctly, I can hear it when I'm on Mill Street. I've Street. heard that on my um, house. But it's <laughs> not, with Mill Street's you know, so far out of, I shouldn't say so far, removed from the blasting site that even that air horn's very hard to hear, depending, especially if the wind's blowing towards Essex, you're not gonna hear um, that from where you're standing. But it does go out to 250 feet. So I have stood there. Stop on the highway and listen for it. So uh, it is following all the regulations. Good question. What's the duration of the permit? How long is this going to go on for? So uh, my permit I issued is for three months. So real, if they have to go after, I think it's September twenty eighth. Though I think sometime mid September is, range, they have to reapply for an extension for that permit. Thank you, Chief. I think we're going to move on to the rest of the self-signaling hearing. Um, thank you again, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Because we might want to tell. You want me to say something? Because if we got through all 14 of these, and they take us on to the first one. We're not even going to get to it. Yeah, I don't think so. Chris? Yeah. If I'm wrong, I'm going to stop. Yeah. 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 So, you want to suggest that anybody who was online wants to do less for every press to reach out to the market? Just because there's a pad of paper here, but that's not good for them. Um, Just a case. Good idea. To those folks who are online, um, obviously you couldn't sign the paper that's here. So if you are interested in the pre-blast survey, if you could let Mark Resnick know, and he will pass that information on. Sue, so I'll have those papers in town hall tomorrow between 9 and 2. Oh, great. Thank you, Gail. If people want to sign the physical paper, you can see Gail tomorrow between 9 and 2. Thank you. Yeah, I'm in the assessor's office from 9 to, nine to 2. Thank you. Um, buy on, I think it's going to be a bit. Um, okay. Uh, we'll try and run through the rest of these quickly. All right. Um, we're on to number two. <laughs> Hours of construction. Um, okay. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, essentially what uh, Mark Resnick had uh, proposed. It, it's uh, modified a little bit. I did add the sentence that said no blasting would occur earlier than eight. In, in fact, we don't anticipate blasting before 10. Uh, it's so, important to make those uh, changes, yeah. Uh, other than that, I think it, it's fairly straightforward. I did, uh, Mark Resnick, uh, at Peter Bordeaux's suggestion, uh, delete state holidays because there are some state holidays that, uh, that are observed without uh, construction being called. I think this is probably one that the board is going to want to discuss um, at our next hearing. Um, hours and uh, scope. So, That's fine. And, um, and uh, now, in, in light of what Mary said about you're just having received this and, and the hour and others on the agenda, uh, in spite of the fact that we were hoping to, to finish up in September, at the first meeting in September, it's apparent now that there, there may be need for another meeting. Uh, and you're not averse to that. I think there's a lot to digest here, and we could continue to go through it if you'd like. Uh, it's up to you. I... Um, well, let's discuss with the board. We had put a tentative meeting of August 26th. Um, I don't know if folks have already cleared. Not available. Not available. Okay. Um, 
do you, how does the board feel about continuing our discussion or continuing now for something? September meeting? The hot the hot button for the last couple of weeks has been item number three. Excuse me, yeah, item number three on that water avenue. If we could discuss that one. The other ones are all certificate of occupancy and permit stuff just later down the road. This one is a hot button right now. Uh, and and uh, we'd be happy to address that tonight. If, and then we, then we can move away. From and we've got Darren on the phone too, so it'd be yeah. good. And, and we have Sam Gregorio on the call, and Sam is, as you recall, from TEC. Uh, he has uh, provided a number of things uh, as tools for this discussion. Uh, one is uh, oh, good. one is a look at uh, Atwater Avenue. Yes, he, uh, the, the measurements have been confirmed. You're welcome. we're well aware of uh, potential safety issues on Atwater Avenue, but as you can see from the plan that I just gave you, uh, and as you may recall from prior discussions, there are some real uh, physical constraints with respect to Atwater Avenue that limit what can be done. However, uh, considering those constraints, uh, Sam has suggested uh, three primary uh, traffic calming measures uh, that cell signaling uh, would uh, be happy to install, and they're itemized in uh, a sketch that was attached to uh, this these conditions that I gave you. And it, Sam, do you want to run through uh, your traffic calming measures and provide an explanation as to how you arrived at these measures? Um, sure, I assume that everybody's looking at the graphics right now when I start talking, right? Before I go? <laughs> it's this one. Oh, it's going to be. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Once again, I'm sorry about this. This one? Put it off behind me so it's less glaring. Um, so, once again. Which is what we got tonight? Yeah. Yes. Just give us one minute. <laughs> Give us one minute. I'll give you five. That's great. Then. Okay. Are you all set, Mary? So, Thank you. For Sam, while, while we're looking, this is Peter. How are you? Um, just a quick question here. Um, the widths of the road that you have here, that, that's the existing width of the road? Yes. So those are, there is twofold. So those are the widths of the roadway that are directly off the survey. So that's down to the exact measurements and survey showed. And then um, going through the measurements last Friday, um, I, I walked out to Atwater Ave and took a wheel out to, well, say the plus or minus of each of these locations with the orange crossbar going across. I might have been like a foot or two in each direction from it because it's, I'm doing that based on the wheel as opposed to what the survey was. Um, but from there, uh, I took a wheel measurement at each of those locations and got pretty much the exact same number. Again, some of them might have been an inch or two different just because I'm not in the exact same location um, as where the survey, those survey lines are. Uh, but we, we were pretty pretty accurate uh, to where uh, what the survey was. And so uh, to, to just kind of outline what you're looking at, there's a blue line that runs across uh, kind of the top of where the road is. That's the northern side of the by uh, hour. Uh, there's a blue line to the south of that. Uh, you can kind of see the red on top of it. The red is the 25 foot offset from the north side. So that's just kind of giving you the indication of wherever the red is south of the blue line there, that's right next to it. That means the roadway is less than 25 in that area. Um, and so I kind of highlighted that with that yellow marking well above the roadway that just kind of says this is the general length of the roadway that's less than 25 uh, for that. There are, lots, there are locations on the roadway that are more than 25. Um, but there are locations that are not so the pavement just kind of goes in and out. Um, a lot of it based on where the curvature is 
And then on top of it, there's also the weapon lines, uh, which are the greens, and those are the flag weapons. Uh, so that's not even the buffer zone, obviously, the whole entire roadway is within the buffer zone, um, just based on the proximity where the water is. So, so that's kind of what you're looking at in the graphic. Um, so um, once you get about oh, 100 feet down the roadway, because the first 100 feet right from School Street is actually quite wide, um, so that's next to the farm stand, and then it narrows out once you get past the dumpsters uh, on the back side of the farm stand, and that's where basically that less than 25 starts, and it continues for a lot of the roadway. Um, the wider part, and this isn't picked up necessarily on the, um, the because each of these individual orange markers are about 200 feet apart. That was the purpose of this. When you get around the guardrail area, which is right with uh, the brook crossers and the culvert, there actually are uh, a good amount of space in there that's more than 25. Um, uh, but from there, the guardrail kind of blocks from there. So where do you want me to go further? I know you guys are still asking questions. Um, go ahead, Gordon. Just, just a general question. Your measurement is from edge of paved surface to edge of paved surface? Yes. Um, and that's purposely because anything that's outside of that is considered a uh, right now pervious land. So even and there, it might be flat, it might have some gravel in it, it might have attributes that allow there to be potentially roadway at some point. But it would be considered as pervious land, so any change to that area outside of what would be the actual edge of asphalt um, would trigger, um, obviously at that point, anything uh, permeating to the weapons and, uh, and such. But that area outside of paid service actually services drainage collection from the roadway, does it not? Uh, so Whether it's de facto or not, it, it actually does do that. I mean, the roadway right now is... Oh, please, please say that again. I'm, I just want to make sure I understand. The, the drainage from the roadway just goes into the the soil or the the, the natural. This this uh, no right. Yes, right now, yes. Okay, so it just goes. There. So there's no like stormwater treatment along the or stormwater drainage system under the LR. No, it's all runoff. Mark Resnick, are you still with us? I know we had, uh, I guess not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, oh. no, I'm here. Oh. Sorry. Um, <laughs> did you want to comment at this point um, about three and four and Atwater Avenue? I know you had some thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I still feel that it's it's possible to build the sidewalk there. It may not be, um, it may require another level of permitting with CONCOM. I think at the very least we ought to have uh, some plenary discussions with them on that because yes, some areas will have, there will have to be additional impervious area, uh, in, installed, um, you know, and uh, in order to get that in some areas, I mean, the sidewalk can get narrowed down to four feet um, instead of five. Um, it allows it for certain lengths, but um, I, I still feel that um, that would be <laughs> the best way of addressing this. Um, and secondly, um, the last sentence referred to um, traffic calming is substantially set forth in Exhibit B, which calls for what appears to be like grooved rumble strips installed in the pavement. Um, so, my couple of concerns with that. Obviously, I believe um, Wes and Samson had some concerns with that, but the other concern I have is also <clears throat> related to just the condition of the asphalt there. Um, um, so, um, and, uh, so, um, yeah. So, Darren, and, oh, I'm sorry, Mark, I didn't. Yeah. And I was just going to say, well, other traffic calming or types of uh, rumble strips should be considered as well. Um, so, that's all. Thank you. Uh, Darren, uh, Weston, and Samson, do you want to comment on this right now? Uh, if you'd like us to, certainly we can. We received some of the information from the applicant last week. Um, we have some concerns about the application of a sidewalk. 
Uh, so we did a review of that. We sent some information to the town this morning. I can run through. Um, some of the latest figures are, are new, so we uh, can yeah. comment on, okay, on all of I didn't of mean those. to put you on the spot. Um, oh, no, no, that, that's fine. I mean, I guess, yeah, we can go through, I guess, the roadway width, um, as mentioned, uh, from the edge of existing pavement to the wetland to the north. Um, most spaces was about 12 feet. Um, certainly there was some complexity of building in that area. If we, if the town required a sidewalk. Um, it is abutting a wetland area, so there's up to the compound considerations Mark was raising uh, would come into effect. Um, there are allowances in the stormwater handbook for bike and pedestrian paths, which the sidewalk may fall into. Um, that might give some meaning to the applicant on stormwater controls. Um, and I do have our traffic engineer on the call, so uh, we did look at some of the traffic calming measures, but I'll let Doug speak to those, um, including the rumble strips and some of the other signage that was proposed. That would be great. Um, if you wouldn't mind. And Hello. Uh, Go ahead. Yes, this is Doug Osso from Austin Sampson. I was the same traffic engineer that reviewed the uh, previous traffic study. Um, what I was able to see and review was a basically two page memo. I had one page worth of writing and then I had a figure. Um, from what I could see from the screen, the figure looked a little bit different, so uh, bear with me. It's not the exact one that I was looking at. If you'd like, I can share the screen to show what I was looking at, um, but it's not necessarily required. I don't think I can figure that out. <laughs> to be perfect, <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I'm not allowed to share my screen. It would have to be permission from you, so I'll, I'll oh, just talk through. Laura, can you tell um, me how to do it? <laughs> yeah. It was referring to the memo, a uh, memo dated um, July. I'm sorry. Let me scroll back up to see this. A uh, memo dated July 29th um, by Sam, um, and it more or less talked about the desire that was proposition to add a sidewalk and that the applicant, the traffic engineer, uh, feels that it wouldn't be too advantageous. Well, there's different things that was talked about, but most of it was if we kept it within the existing um, surface width that it is right now, it would narrow the lanes and you know, biking bikers would not be able to pass each other. And then it provided a, a figure that showed a few different um, recommended uh, traffic calming measures. And that includes some signage, some pavement marking, and okay. the road okay. strips that were already there. I think you might be able to share now. All right, let me look into this. Press this button. Oh, that does look better. All right, just double check. Are you seeing my screen now? Yes. Thanks, Laura. Okay. So this is a figure that I'm referring to um, above is the um, but common centering around four different um, means for traffic calming that was Proposed for consideration. Um, not necessarily all of them are proposed by the applicant. It was a, a letter addressed to the applicant, so it would be the applicant's proposal to the town, uh, which and where it is included, uh, which could be just boarded this. Um, the first one, I'll zoom in here so we can read them, was to add a center line and shoulder line pavement markings um, to establish lane lines. Uh, we Definitely agree with that. It's usually always a good idea. Um, I recall in the June 10th meeting, there were concerns brought up about speeding along that water, as well as cutting around corners so that you go even faster. Um, adding in the lines, not only by slightly restricting things, it is a little bit psychological that people tend to travel a little bit slower when there are striped lines and is a calming method that is very common. Um, the second one refers to shared use lane pavement markings. I'll shift over here. And it's referring to what's sometimes called the sharrows to indicate as biker, yes, you can bike here on, 
on within the lane as well as two drivers see and know that bikers are allowed to be in that location and that they need to share the road for that. Um, in this particular figure, if I recall correctly, the June 10th meeting, these were discussed as being uh, potentially provided. Um, at that time, there was not the green rectangle that is sometimes provided. Um, often, you normally see them in more urban areas. Um, my comp for this was, we are definitely okay with shared pavement markings. Um, I personally have the preference of making sure that any use of typical traffic markings is common throughout the town. And I'm aware that the town uses shared pavement markings other locations, but without the green rectangle. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying don't have a green rectangle, but keep in mind that any maintenance will be done by the town and would likely only refresh um, upon the maintenance schedule the, the markings, unless that policy is changed by the town. Um, the third was three sets of rumble strips. Um, and there was a little bit of discussion um, between emails about the concerns uh, town staff for this. This was, um, in my opinion, this is, it's a method of traffic calming that would be atypical for normal locations. And there are a few items that I would be concerned with, particularly when it comes to freezing um, conditions, if there's any difference in materials that can cause some frost thaw issues and create any vertical disturbance, which is usually not great for a bicycle. It, so it, it may slow down, it would certainly slow down vehicles, have an effect for that, um, but it would be a detriment to bicyclists going over the same area. And also, uh, for consideration, you would not want any rumble strips near curves if we're looking at uh, freezing temperatures near a narrow road in a forested area without much recovery space for vehicles. And so I, I would, my recommendation for the town would be to shy away of uh, potential liability when it comes to vertical disturbance along the way. Um, and then the fourth was uh, two speed radar, radar feedback signs. And that's also a getting to be a more common um, treatment and it has been found to work semi-effectively. There are still some people that will not really care, but there are some people that will, you know, kind of conform to the peer pressure saying, oh yeah, it's the speed and, you know, I really am going this way. It's a feedback system that, that does show um, results of general traffic calming. Um, and they propose, at least in this figure, it shows pair of those near the longest stretch of road, which would typify being the places where speeding would be easiest to happen on a longer stretch of road. So that's something that would be certainly acceptable and welcome for um, the roadway for traffic calming. Thank you very much. Um, Great. Does Nancy ask a question? Yes, Laura. Yes, one more shown, uh, kind of bump out little uh, curb. Show yeah, so that's that's the afternoons okay. issue set of conditions. So we haven't had a chance to review that curb extension. Um, and yeah, yeah, we would want to have a little bit more detail on the layout. I mean, obviously this is a schematic level. Um, I think it's a little difficult to review um, without the actual locations of potential uh, curb extensions and how that would impact traffic. Um, and then, you know, as I was mentioning, like the construction materials of the rumble strips, the section view, obviously I know these are just coming together, um, but those would be helpful to re review um, for the long-term sort of performance of these give uh, you, traffic uh, measures. Give you a little more time on that one, <laughs> I think. Go ahead. I have a question for Darren and Doug. Thank you for the presentation. This is Laura. Um, I thought that I saw a reference in a Weston Sox Sampson memo to a 22 foot, two 11 foot travel lanes as being a um, acceptable condition. Can you speak to the width of the lane and what might be, is there, is there a narrower lane that we could consider that would be safe and possibly allow for pedestrian, um, a pedestrian route? 
Um, I wouldn't say that there is a specific minimum requirement. It is a little bit more of how the, the, the location feels about things. Um, decades ago, the standard was 12 feet wide, and you'll see that currently in highways and usually major roads will have 12 foot wide lanes. Um, some some jurisdictions are comfortable with having 11 foot wide lanes. Um, in this particular case, um, that figure was proposing striping 11 foot lanes, but then there would be a little bit of shoulder wherever the roadway was wider than 22 feet. Um, and that's certainly viable. I would not say it would be uncomfortable at all. Um, if there was ever curbs, um, or edge of the roadway, restricting completely 11 foot lanes, it would be a little bit uncomfortable, but it would still be fine. Uh, um, it's something that I've certainly recommended in the past. I've seen 10 foot lanes before. Um, when you get smaller, you do have to worry about some things, uh, such as buses, but you don't have buses going down the road. Um, and depending on your snowplow vehicle, um, there might be some consideration if your um, plow um, that is wider, uh, a particularly wide one um, for snow management. Um, but in general, I would say long foot is fine um, for this situation. Sarah Creighton, uh, are you? No, oh, okay. Sarah. Sarah Creighton. Um, thank you. So um, my question was essentially the same. Um, if 11 foot wide lanes are acceptable, is that mean acceptable with to edge of pavement to a curb um, if we were to add a sidewalk or um, and and to the last comment uh, we do have storage areas with presumably the moving trucks going in and that and a lot of landscape equipment um, in the current uh, Beaver Dam Road um, uh, industrial condos there. So um, the use and I believe cell signaling indicated they will have some delivery trucks and um, larger vehicles. So the question is really what what's the minimum width that you you know edge of pavement to edge of pavement or edge of pavement to a curb if we have a sidewalk and do we really can we um, and so that's my first question and the second question is. I understand the sidewalk certainly helps pedestrian safety, but when you narrow down a road to a 10 foot width lane or 11 foot width lane, and cyclists are sharing the road, does that create a more a, a less safe condition for cyclists? Thank you for the. Oh, I am not. Just had to double check. I wasn't muted. Um, thank you for the questions. Um, in the case that there are large delivery trucks, um, it would be nice to have a little bit of clarification, but if, if we're talking like UPS trucks and sort of delivery vehicles like that, they tend to be somewhat a normal size. Um, as an example, buses tend to be fairly, transit buses tend to be fairly wide. And those, when we do have curves, we do tend to prefer 12 foot lanes um, for the navigation for that. Um, in the case that there is a potential sidewalk, I would imagine it would be an edge of pavement on one side, and then when you get to the sidewalk, you have um, a curb adjacent to it. Um, in many situations in Massachusetts that I've been part of, a uh, 12 foot from the center of the double yellow line to the edge of the curb has been acceptable in many different jurisdictions for um, allowing large vehicle transit through um, a roadway. And I will remind that a, a standard lane and a highway, which also supports you know, large semi-trucks, are also typically 12 feet wide. And so it, it is very acceptable to have a 12 foot lane um, and 11 foot if you're including um, a striped shoulder um, to have there. As far as cyclists, when they're using the roadway, um, 
you'll generally want to have a, a cyclist be considered about five feet or six feet wide, and then it's Massachusetts law to have four feet of clearance between the handlebars of the cyclist and any passing vehicle. So you have to consider about 10 feet for a vehicle to pass if we if you're concerned about passing um, bicyclists, uh, which you would not, there would be certain areas that you would not be able to pass because it's a double yellow as opposed to a dash stripe because of uh, sight distance. Um, but at, if you're looking at 11 foot lanes, um, there's not too much difference between um, two feet of difference if you're passing somebody because you already have to be with nearly fully within the other lane in order to pass. Uh, looks like Sam Gregorio wants to add something at this point. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, just to uh, go back to uh, the general thoughts on uh, lanes and width. Um, so uh, the, the general standard minimum uh, for a lane um, is 11 feet for this type of roadway. Um, again, that doesn't mean you couldn't go less. It just means that you're, you're against standard at that point, and usually would have like a design exception that has to be uh, put together for providing something of that. Um, just to remind that Atwater is a is a public way. It's not something like an in, even like a neighborhood road. It's carrying the landscaping trucks for our neighbors, the Mac, other commercial developments. Um, and I say that as uh, the I couldn't find it in the zone regulation, but I found it in the um, the um, subdivision regs uh, for the town. The minimum street width on those are 22 feet. Uh, so that would suggest 11 foot lanes, no shoulders. And so at this point, going something less than 11 would generally even against what Manchester would typically want to see on their uh, streets themselves. Um, so uh, right now, the way the graphic is shown is for 11 foot travel lanes, uh, typical for uh, a minimum for types of roadways. And we do 11s on all our different products, even on arterial roadways, like, such as, let's say, School Street, if that was a roadway we were doing to work on, for instance, major work. Uh, so it's not something that doesn't happen actually yeah, quite a bit for that particular. We have the advantage here that because it is just a little wider than that 22, uh, we do provide ourselves with the ability to have some shoulder um, that still goes with it with the edge line. Uh, so the edge line is just not really at the edge of the pavement itself, um, which um, if you get any kind of cracking or anything like that in the asphalt pavement over time, you know that, that line goes when you do that. So provide a little bit of shoulder does help in that sense. Um, so beyond that, um, any and just going to one of the other aspects in terms of uh, the rumble strips, the reason why those particular rumble strips were, were looked at um, is at twofold. One, the town was actually talking themselves about rumble strips and having that as something that we could be uh, could provide. So that's where we went with that particular effort. And that type of rumble strip was looked at for this particular roadway based on the type of roadway that it is. So there was talk about like longitudinal uh, rumble strips. Those are much the entire length of the roadway, something you see, let's say, on the, uh, the shoulder of a freeway. Uh, which are still used on regular roadways too. Uh, the difference here would be is we're going to have the bikes up against the edge of the roadway a lot on this roadway, and so we don't want them going over the run strips through the entire length. And then second to that is um, the ones that are the lane based, the ones that were shown in that picture and on the graphic. Uh, they don't have to be that exact width of the lane that we're shown. We can cut them down an extra foot or two on each side, still getting the tire of the wheelbase of a typical vehicle, but still allowing the uh, bicycle to bypass on the side of them without uh, touching them. Uh, so that's where we're going with that. Um, the other part about the longitudinal uh, run strips, I believe I brought this up at the last meeting as well, is uh, where those are usually tip, uh, typically used on wider type road which is less obstruction. So where the natural reaction when you get that is you kind of jerk your wheel uh, because you think you're falling asleep and running off the shoulder. Uh, so, and that's just not really what's going to happen on that water, but the natural inkling of when you get one of those on the freeway is that's why it's happening. Is you're kind of drifting off, you're doing a lane departure until you correct. Uh, the difference between a freeway or a larger roadway is you have area to correct. On Atwater, we really don't. Uh, Atwater's not wide. We've all kind of established that, and there's trees on the side <laughs> all the way along the flank. So the correctable danger, the danger would be is if someone were to do a full correction and try to jerk their wheel to get back in the roadway without realizing that they don't even need to, they just do it naturally. Um, there's a chance that you end up off the other side of the road because the road's just not that wide. Um, and then the obstructions on the side of the road are trees and water. Um, we're off water guardrail. So 
that's really the, the idea behind the, the lean type uh, rumble strips that we were looking at. Uh, similar again, something that you would do with approaching a toll route or approaching a stop control, for instance, on a major roadway. Uh, usually sometimes if there's a, a curve in a roadway approaching a stop sign of something at a higher speed, you usually actually have a couple rounds of those to kind of warm something because especially when you've been on a long tangent beforehand, because you're not thinking the stop sign is going to happen. Um, here we do have the added benefit that actually everybody on the roadway is probably going to know that water avenue is ending X feet away is there's only so many uses on that water. We're all people who are probably using it every day. Um, so yeah. um, beyond that, um, I'm sure there might be more comment related to uh, the sidewalks. I'll hold that part off until now when we get there. Great, thank you. Uh, Mayor, I had a overarching question and then a few other questions. Are we still debating a sidewalk or no sidewalk? Is that the question? Okay. I know, I know Mark Resnick is an advocate for the sidewalk. Okay, so we don't, something we'll, we don't know yet. Right. Okay. Um, and then I guess I would ask Cell Signaling kind of what are the biggest delivery trucks you see going there? I mean, is it going to be bigger than what goes to a warehouse or anything? Probably not, right? There'll be tractor trailers that go to Cell Signaling. Tractor trailers? Okay. Um, and I'm sure it has been, I, I, there's so many papers that I forget some things. <laughs> um, have we discussed the water table of that road? I know going over it at certain times, it's flooded. Um, have we discussed that as part of this? Okay. Um, I think we should discuss that because it floods and or freezes. Um, and then, this is beyond cell signaling, but with Atwater being a public road, the town is potentially um, proposing an MBTA overlay district up there, which would be residential. So any discussions with Atwater should be looking at that it's also a re for residential road, um, not just commercial. Any other questions from the board? Yes, Chris. So. Uh at the moment, no one uses Atwater Ave for walking very much, and that's because it's not very conducive to walking. On occasion, I do see people <clears> walking. But people, yeah, but it's not. Outside. You're going to go for a walk I in Manchester. Yeah. You're not going to walk. There. <laughs> I get, you know, you wouldn't go for a stroll down the Atwater Ave. But that may be because it's not because it's not physically very conducive yeah. to walking. It's true. What I'm wondering is, what is this curb about? Why do we need a curb? And can we discuss a, a walkway? that even not only doesn't have a curb, like it's done in a lot of places, and maybe not it's not even pervious. I know Hamilton and Wenham have walking paths along roads that are wood chips. Or, I'm not suggesting that, but maybe it's a, a, a more uh, pervious surface that could be on the shoulder of the road next to the wetland and wouldn't disturb the wetland at all and would allow people to walk safely or more safely than right on the road, which they'd have to do now. I'm just throwing it out there as an alternative. Anyone else on the board? Okay. Um, Mayor, do I, I, I do. I'd like, like to pick up what Mary was talking about when she talked about the water on the road. If, if the, it appears the intent is to patch the existing road, correct? Not completely dig it up, replace it, create a new, no, it's to patch it. So if we were to do a sidewalk, that would require us to go into, extending into the wetlands, and it would require us to also put some sort of drainage control on there, because we'd be stopping the flow of water from, to the, I guess it would be the south side, when everything would be going to the north side. So I think the question is larger, more, larger than just simple patching and replacing it, do we, do we, Manchester, do we want a new roadway down there to service all these additional needs? I actually didn't think of the MBTA, but if we were to put, we would really need to put a new roadway to service the CST, CST traffic and the additional traffic on there. So I don't know where it goes. I have a personal opinion, but I tend to agree with the traffic engineers that, that an 11-foot wide roadway is the appropriate way without 
a sidewalk or a curb line and then a sidewalk there. But it's just personal opinion. But that's a very good point, Mary. I didn't think of that. Drainage control is a big deal on that road. Mark? Have we looked at, if, if the goal is to have a sidewalk with a vertical curb on one side, and the sidewalk can, at some extent, narrow down to four feet for a certain stretch and still be accessible, considered accessible. What does that get us for lane width? Have we, have we back Sam, into that? Sam Gregorio looked at that okay. and can probably speak to why you concluded that the sidewalk wasn't feasible, Sam. Yeah, 10 feet. Yeah, so in, if the idea, let separate this into two things. If the yeah. idea was to eliminate it's not going to eliminate it all, but let's say eliminate the um, the environmental impact of any environmental permitting. Uh, that's basically the idea of keeping the sidewalk within the paved surface that's currently there now. So you're not adding uh, impervious land. Uh, with that, four point absolute minimum on sidewalk width by pro mag standards, uh, half and six inches of curb, so four and a half feet uh, of space dedicated to the pedestrian. And right now, we're at a lot of this, and from that first graphic that showed all the width, we're at a lot of locations. And this isn't exactly a straight you know, shot on the uh, on the edge of pavement either. It's kind of going a little bit in and out too. So it's right. still going to be a little bit. But a lot of that area is now less than 20 feet of roadway remaining. And so that would be area that's combined for bicycles and vehicles. So where TDC's position is that point, where we, we would want to see 11, lane, in 11 foot lanes minimum to not just our tenant, but that's even again. I talked about Manchester's subdivision regulation for a street, or 22 feet minimum. Um, if we're, we would be at about 19 and a half to 19 feet at a lot of the roadway, mixed bicycles and vehicles at that point. And so any any location where you would have cars and start passing each other, people are naturally going to try to you know move away from the center line when they do that. And that's where we get the idea of. You know, there's a real good chance, especially with a lot of landscape vehicles, are going to be a little wider. Some of them are still going to be, you know, uh, larger truck vehicles. The, the idea of if we're down to like 19 feet on the road, that there's going to be potential issues with mirrors and pedestrians on that sidewalk. Uh, just from the natural effect of people wanting to stay away from the center line, especially another car passing. Um, did you say so, mirror? I just wanted to understand you. Did you say mirrors like the, the side view mirrors on a truck? And yeah. Or, with a pedestrian on the sidewalk? Even a Ford F-150, which is, you know, still, you know, yeah. eight, eight and a half feet wide. And we're talking again about a lot of this location is 19 foot wide roadway now, mm -hmm. if there's a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So again, anything that provides a, you know, minimum, what, what I would call a minimum need for a roadway width, which is 22, and that's not even including shoulders yet, um, that would require, you know, widening out the roadway by two to three feet mm -hmm. to do that, which obviously is all now new and impervious land and a uh, con con question, uh, weapon uh, um, mass uh, DEP question uh, for okay. what needs to happen. And then on top of that, again, um, there is the, I, I heard earlier, the idea of a side path type sidewalk. Um, if that were just something that we'd, we'd be done, we'd, um, it would it be something that TEC would design to be against the roadway. There would still need to be some type of buffer now between that side path and the roadway, especially when there's no curbing and to act as the protection uh, for the pedestrian. It just if we're talking about side path, gravel path, or whatever it happens to be up against uh, asphalt pavement, you're it's basically at that point just stop pedestrians in the roadway to me. Um, there's no, especially at night, there's no delineation uh, and visibility to see what's different. So that's where the curbing usually comes in. Curbing provides the vertical separation. It provides a bumper against a tire. Unless you're going right, unless you're trying to do it, most cars aren't going to jump the curb unless you are trying to do it. So uh, that's where you do that. Curbing comes in. And when you do that, we now have the stormwater question. And what do we do with all the stormwater, which now has to be treated? Uh, um, I know the idea came about pitching the roadway back, but now that would be, if that was the idea, now we're sending all the water to the south side without drain, a new drainage system that's adding a whole bunch of new water to a bunch of wetlands on the south side that wasn't actually happening before, which is another, you know, EP, uh, DEP, Kong Kong, and uh, potential issue. So um, whichever way we go, there's, there's going to be now water resources that are directly affected um, uh, if a sidewalk is added 
um, in, in order to maintain what I would believe to be the appropriate 22 feet on that water avenue if that was ever going to happen. Um, right now, we do have the added benefit of campers. There is not a lot of pedestrian traffic. That doesn't mean we have to preclude anything from happening in the future. Uh, but the I, the recommendations that TEC has provided is to maintain the road within its current form, which gives you the 22 feet of lane traffic plus some extra space for um, shoulder so you're not directly off the edge of the roadway uh, from your lane. Um, thank you for answering the sidewalk question. I was just trying to get to that lane width, so now I understand it's 10 foot or sometimes less. Separately, apart from the sidewalk, if there's an issue with surface ponding on the road, which may be entirely unrelated to water table. I, what I've heard is that the Due to the construction traffic on the road, you're not talking about a repair, but you're resurfacing the entire road. Is that right? Or did I not hear that? No. You're not and, doing and, that. And, and I think that it probably would make sense for, since this is a public way, for Chuck Dam from the DPW to weigh in. We haven't heard from him as to what his opinion may be as to the existing conditions, whether he's aware of that bonding for right. and what he thinks about alternatives. I, I agree because if there is any issue with surface ponding, you know, sometimes resurfacing can address those things with some, you know, the, the resurfacing can address <clears throat> some minor drainage and grading issues at the same time. So I think what's missing here is Chuck Dam looking at all this and giving and some advice. I think he's on vacation. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's August, I guess. <laughs> he's entitled. So maybe maybe we can table number three. Although I think Sarah had her hand yes, up. Sarah so. Creighton. Sarah Creighton, do you have your hand on? Yeah, to unmute, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, I think that the other question is we're, we're struggling to understand the best ways to improve Atwater Avenue and what improvements we would like to see on Atwater for the benefit of the town and people who use Atwater. I think the other question is how much of that is the responsibility of cell signaling in this process? Um, and I think there's some responsibility. There's going to be added traffic and added um, use, uh, significant new use for the road. And the road is um, not perfect, like many roads in town. But whether the entire improvement to uh, whether they be, um, uh, you know, stormwater resurfacing and, and or a sidewalk should be the responsibility of cell signaling. I think might help us to get through, if we could decide that we might see our way through to the special permit, um, and then the town may have to address some of the deficiencies on Atwater Avenue, or maybe cell signaling meets us a portion, you know, zero to 100 percent of meeting those deficiencies. So I think that is um, important for this special permit discussion. Um, and I do think Chuck probably is part of that. Um, and then, so I'll leave it at that. Oh, the other part of that is we do have kind of an opportunity perhaps to kick the can down the road a bit and that cell signaling is going to build this project into major phases, phase one and phase two. So one possibility is to address Atwater Avenue with the um, striping and traffic calming as proposed in phase one, but then ask that, a, that this issue be re revisited um, in phase two. Good point. Sarah, do you um, have any objection to us not resolving the details of this issue tonight, but kicking this one over to September also? Um, Laura's not going to be able to be here in August, on August 26th. Um, yeah, I think so. I think, I think we're going to need a couple of different okay. proposed motions that we're going to have to vote and we may not have agreement but I think we're going to have to make a decision that's my that's my opinion we're going to, we may not have full agreement 
on it. Um, and I think the question is not what is the ideal uh, condition for Atwater Avenue, but what of the ideal or near ideal condition of Atwater Avenue is the responsibility of self-signaling in the special permit? That's the issue that, to me is before us for in the next month. I, I um, thank Sarah for what she said. I think that's a great suggestion to whatever we, let's get to agreement on what's within the CST scope with the input from DPW and potentially flag this for, you know, phase two further improvements, further discussion. I would like to get Chuck and Nate's opinion on the specific as well as um, Weston Sampson. So I know there's, they're not ready to do that tonight, right. but on specific, um, you know, the rumble strips and are they good for bikes and this curb bump out, which I think starts to change the character of the road from kind of a rural road to feels like it's part of a suburban, you know, cul-de-sac or, or certain development. So um, what's the kind of, if the sidewalk's not feasible um, within the scope of what we're doing right now, then what are the best you know, collection of improvements that sort of preserve the character of the road, but make it safer for bikes and, and mm -hmm. slow the traffic and, you know, do everything they can, but then don't take it to, like, let's not do too much. Let's not necessarily glom it up with curb extensions and stuff. So I just I think we have to weigh in on that and Weston and Samson. Sorry, one other thing just to throw in um, from the back court here. And then we had proposed a uh, kind of working group with Mark, and I know he's been sick, and Gordon, and a, um, maybe we can actually have a meeting of uh, uh, Gordon, Mark, and I'd, I'd be happy to join that, um, to come up with three proposals for the voting, for the, for the special permit. You know, a phased approach, um, an all-in approach, and a, um, yeah. Thank you do nothing approach or something that's kind of three different phases that we can kind of uh, propose to the board and, and figure out which one um, has the majority of us for it. So maybe we'll, if that's amenable, we can re have that working group that Gordon, I don't think you ended up meeting, did you, Gordon? Uh, I've, had, I've had a discussion with, I just had a discussion with you and a discussion with Mark Resnick offline, but that's it. Right. So let's, let's actually get together and, and Maybe come up with three proposals if that makes sense, or two proposals. And for one Nate or Chuck? Yeah, for Chuck. And Nate, yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Mary? Um, I'm happy to be on that. I, I know Sarah's busy with a lot of committees, so I'm happy to be on that as well. Um, and you have two residents with their hands up. I think I just want to get through this, and then we'll take comments on self signaling before we move on to the other. Um, <laughs> So we're agreed that we're going to kick the rest of this off until September 9th, is that correct? Unless there could be a meeting between now and then, but that doesn't seem practical. It seems like Laura wouldn't, wouldn't be able to be here on August 26th. Yes. Can I ask a question for Gordon and the, um, the other members of the committee? Number six also talks about potential improvements. Is that something that Chuck Dam and others can weigh in on at yeah, the same time? Maybe you got, maybe all this stuff. I think there's quite a bit that could be combined oh, in that yeah. the Atwater and the traffic flow issues. And I know Mark Resnick has some specific ideas and uh, comments on those issues. So, so that would be number three, number six, and is there another one? Number nine. Number Number nine. That's just construction. I don't mean just, but it's construction management. It's not about a permanent improvement. Is there any other permanent improvement? Well, five. I mean, if you want to wrap in the traffic, this is fine. That's the timing question. I guess. Okay. All right. I think that's it then. Yeah, I, and I do. I do think that Chuck and Nate can weigh in on this. And, uh, and also, I, me being my background is working for, as a consulting engineer and architect. I love to have the, the the professionals also participate 
discussions, but we'll have our our discussion first and see where that goes. And we'll be more you clean. know where to find us if you need us. I, I do. We'll have nice, clean, defined where we're going to go. Unless there's an objection from others on the board, I do want to just um, read into this part of the hearing the fact that we did receive a, an analysis from the Finance Committee. Um, everyone had a chance to look at that. We don't need to make decisions on that tonight if we want to include their proposal for any special permit, but we want it to be part of the public record of the hearing. And uh, um, some of the specific conclusions were that their expectation of the total tax revenue was going to exceed the amount projected um, by the initial review uh, based upon the fact that properties in Manchester are assessed higher per square foot than those in Ipswich, which is what the prior review was based on. Um, the conclusion was that the annual tax revenue um, uh, would be 370000 to 430000 after phase one is completed in 2027 and 750000 to 900000 after phase two is completed in 2033. Um, and the other thing was the building permit fees, but I think Sarah Creighton had possibly an issue on that one, but they thought that the fees received by the town during construction would be around <coughs> 300000 in both 2026 and 2027. <coughs> um, and they, this was one of the conditions that they wanted to have included in the special permit was a third-party inspection consultant um, regarding that. Um, I just want to make sure everyone has a chance to read that in detail before um, anything else on Do the other memos that we got? Um, Are you going to read those in? So um, we got an inner office memo. Um, remind me. <laughs> to Mark Lovsky from Sam Gregorio. And then we got an email um, today from Darren. Right. Right, he was talking yeah. about that a little bit. Right. Everyone should have a chance to look at that, too. And then I think we, for a public comment, we received... Excuse me, are you done talking about the roadway? Because I've been waiting. Um, just one minute, Sandy. I, I do okay, see that your I just hands up. Know. No, you're not being ignored. <laughs> Even though you feel like it, I see that your hands up. Um, we did have, oh, the other was the <coughs> email from Ms. Thomas that she already uh, referenced. Did you have anything else? To right, anything else from the board before I take? Sandy's comment, and then there is one or two others. Sandy Rogers, you're up. Okay, thanks. I just wasn't sure. Um, so I just want to say it's good to hear both Samuel and others speaking about ComCom -Com a lot. Um, one of the main considerations is the runoff on that road. Um, and I wanted to know if there has been a traffic study done and an estimate in all phases as to the true traffic that this complex is going to create. Um, not only the amount of employees and cars, the ongoing amount of deliveries, the facilities management, everything else. Um, is that information available? In the original traffic study, yes, which is on the planning board part of the website with the CST tab. You should be able to find it there. And that separates <coughs> out both phase one and phase two? I believe so. Okay, thank you. I think that's very important when determining long-term 
who's responsible for ensuring that the runoff is taken care of properly on this road because it's pertinent to the town water supply. Thank you. Great. Um, Dean, did you have a comment related to cell signaling? Yes, thank you. Um, after hearing the discussion on the, how hard it's gonna to be to put a sidewalk on Atwater Ave, um, as a pedestrian who sometimes has to leave his car at Beaver Dam Road. Um, one other solution might be for a pedestrian bridge over 128 to Mill Street to solve the pedestrian and bike access to this site. Um, those ramps on School Street are getting harder and harder to cross and that could potentially bypass all that for pedestrian and bicyclists to connect with the town. So it's just another idea. I think the town might be able to get a good grant for that, if it were, but that would be a potential solution to the um, sidewalk problem to consider. That's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mark Resnick, you have your hand up. Mark Resnick? Um, oh, that was um, from earlier. Um, I just wanted to, um, when you were talking about Chuck, um, I met with him last week about this and um, uh, um, sidewalk issue and um, he also uh, talked a little bit about the culvert and, and um, you know uh, that uh, the public works may be able to participate in some of the work but uh, again it's it's all up for kind of negotiation and permitting and and to see what what um, what can be, be be done there? So, um, I guess they're still negotiating and discussing the color replacement and utilities. So, so anyone from cell signaling want to address that right now? Uh, I, I don't think there's anything to discuss at this point. Okay. Anything further, Mark? No. Okay. No. Um, I think then okay. I'll take a motion to continue the cell signaling hearing to September 9th. At, why don't we say seven, just to be sure. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Sarah, Sarah, sorry, yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, bye then. Can we get you some coffee or anything? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to grow I did a lot of money. What I do really need, though, is a power cord. I forgot to bring one. Well, I have a new bag, right? Does anyone have an Apple power cord? I need my apple at once. I just wondering, like, how does something that can be? Mm -hmm. yeah, I might be able to get Thank you. Mary, do you have a. I like the idea. I don't know if it's feasible. I have to walk it because I, I want to. Yeah, I want to. You know that I didn't just like it. It's scary. It's just like, what is it? It's an interesting idea. How can some environmentally sensitive walkway along the side of it? You just need to wait for Peter to come back in on the weekend. I like that idea. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. 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 Of the idea, I know that there's no loss of construction there for drainage. There's a way to put 
it was great. I being one of them. My daughter's working on it this summer. But all, all now this came. You young people out there, it's all signaling. I felt young carrying a 35 pound pack. Definitely still young. Good idea. Uh, I saw one. Yeah. I, I think I saw one. We have books and shoes and paper. Yeah, I, I saw one, I think, yesterday. Sketches and stuff. I draw and then I. You see, when I, when I do my own drawings, my own projects, and I take old, oh, yeah. I took the yeah. old high school, uh, old high school drawings, and I took all the old and I ran out of the back. All right. Okay. On to the harbor. <sighs> Is there a motion to reopen the hearing Come on, on Morse Pier <laughs> and the Leaf Park? Oh. Gordon moved it. I second it. All those in favor, uh, Mary? Yes. Yes. Peter, I vote yes. 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 And I guess we have to Sarah. Thumbs up. Yes. We have to do a roll call um, for the hearing. Uh, Mary Foley? Here. Yeah. Still here. Foley here. Chris Foley. Gordon Brewster. Gordon Brewster. Gordon Brewster. Gordon Brewster. Gordon Brewster. Gordon Brewster. Here. Great. Here. Um, okay. Um, Bion, is there anything that you would want to add uh, regarding specifically issues of lighting, uh, rafting, boat washing, uh, pooling, and information that you give to transient voters when they come and tie up at your dock. Uh, so lighting, I did forward some uh, examples of lighting to the market. I don't know if those could run to you. Uh, the plan is still to have posts with lights that uh, if the Conditions say no lights on the post, which would have dark light, uh, dark sky light on them. To have uh, very low, there are there are solar lights that are literally as high as my boot, with lights that shine down onto the dock. Um, a few of those strategically placed. Uh, uh, as I understand it, the Yacht Club uses them. They do direct the light look very just right down at uh, shoe height so you can see what you're stepping on. Uh, fueling, uh, the town has no plan, no location for fueling. We're actually uh, helping, trying to help uh, Manchester Marine and uh, Crocker deal with future issues with licensing and permitting. There's a company that does. Does this takes care of all the permitting, but the siting of that would be on Manchester Marine property. Uh, town property uh, rafting is already uh, verboten in the regulations. Uh, so we see lighting, rafting, fueling, washing, washing boats. That's if that's a condition to to move this forward, then. I would say if there's a water ban, certainly we've done that in the past. Two years ago, we had a drought and there was a water ban. We did not allow people to wash their boats. With that, I guess I was thinking about the uh, recreational boaters. Um, right, right. So a lot of them don't use fresh water to wash their boats. That's not, not a thing for them. So right, the Reed Park recreational boats. Event of the water being or and just decided they didn't want to keep the washing the boats. 
I'm not going to argue that point. Hmm. Uh, Mark Resnick, anything to add? And my computer is bad, so I can't tell if he is. He might be gone. Okay. Um, any comments, questions from the board? I do have one question. So, so, so by, I'm, I'm trying to get a grasp of what, uh, for lack of a better word, a utility utility pole or stack that would be available for the boats to be tying up. Oh gosh, so uh, I wish I kept the pictures with me. I did provide that. Uh, it's power post. So it's power as electrical power. As electrical power and water. And, and water. And right then there. typically they have lights. Light would be but an integral part of would this be an integral part of the tower. For, for safety on the dock, but uh, so you buy this as a unit and you install it, and then yeah, it costs anywhere place. from nine hundred to three thousand dollars, depending on how uh, Jedi you want it to be. Okay, but that is your intent, though. Right, it's just not specified yet. You don't know exactly. They, they kind of look like this. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the, the lights like pretty benign. It's not. Yeah. It's not too invasive. Right. So here's. Actually, and this is the one that we're discussing specifically. It's it's a slimmer uh, version. Oh yeah, that's what looks like the utility pole. It does have the hose hanger on it, which I am not in favor of. Yeah. Shower. Okay. How tall is that? Uh, these are typical. This one here is 36 inches high. Three feet. Three feet. Yeah. How? What's the frequency on the? Uh, oh, what's the spacing, more or less? Right. So um, I was thinking every four. Uh, I was thinking four to five of these. Uh, or the idea being that the new 500 feet would accommodate. Largely, um, or any overnighters would be accommodated down on that end. So uh, we would have a power post down on that end, mm -hmm. um, down towards the drawbridge. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been some discussion about whether or not we would have one up uh, near the ramp for the staff to have access to, or if we, we had a specific overnighter that needs to be in that spot. So, four or five. I just have one more question. So, I, I was having dinner last night with my very boat crazy people. Oh. Friend, my, they, they travel, they live down on the south shore, they crazy. travel everywhere. <laughs> All of them. They were up here, as a matter of fact, a couple weeks ago. But they said to me, he said, How are you dealing with trash when the boats, when they, when they pull up there? Just drop off their trash. How do they, how do you do that? So uh, actually, uh, they've been using the trash barrels up in. There, there's not a lot right now. You imagine a small kitchen bag going up into the trash barrel in the park. That's there's been no overflow issue with trash of any kind. Um, if you had 500 feet of dock, I imagine right, you would. More overnighters. I would probably direct them over to dumpster the commercial fishing in this. Oh, made around. Don't worry yeah. over to you. I was told that the boaters just dropped the trash anywhere. No. They're in there. Uh, no, we've had, so I would say over the five years, we've probably had two boaters who just have heaved their bags out onto the dock and waved to the to my staff and I come over and said, no, 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 let's <laughs> That's not how we do it here. It's your trash. You, you will please dispose of it appropriately. That's not part of the service. So I took a trip down I, over the weekend. I went there in the morning and I went in the afternoon just to see. I talked to your staff and he, there was very few people there in the morning. It was probably like 9.30, 10 o'clock. But I went back at the end of the day and there was the 
the room was full all the way up to it. And there was boats circling around, waiting, waiting for someone to leave to pull in. So there's definitely a definitely a need to be used for it. So before those docks went in, it was many boats circling around. The fishermen's pier being completely overwhelmed. The fishermen's dock being overwhelmed. The boat club being overwhelmed. So now, uh, some folks might have to wait 10 or 15 minutes for a spot. Um, it's it's vast. It used to be busy in the morning. When there was a breakfast in a restaurant. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's breakfast. We haven't got everyone to the lab and tell you that that, that morning crowd was in stock. So we almost a whole new breakfast place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe a floating breakfast place. Oh, um, <laughs> sure. oh. sorry. Um, so Can you give us a brief, I've asked for it multiple times, not from you, but um, uh, the we've never gotten the CONCOM decision. Um, you said that there was a condition of orders and I've just never seen it. I, I've asked and asked, I've emailed. But yeah, I don't, oh, we, we have provided that order conditions, um, I think after the second meeting. We, we can send it again though. That would be great. Can you send it to the planning board members? We'll send it to yes. Mark and he can. Did you send it to Mark or? Send it to Gail. Send it to Gail. Send it to Gail. Send it to Gail. We, we have sent it to Gail. We'll, it to Gail. We'll, uh, we, we will forward that again. Yep. What, isn't Did that part of the, sorry for interrupting, but isn't it part of the application? The bound application? Is it in the application? I thought it was. I, I think it was. Yeah. To be clear, so we. Um, we've received the order conditions for um, the fisherman's facility for the Morris project, not for Reed. Reed, we just got the certificate, um, MEPA certificate, so we haven't filed with conservation yet. But the Morris order conditions, which we have received, we've um, provided to Cal. <clears throat> okay, and so and then you'll be going for Reed to Concom. Yes, yeah, definitely. And then just my other question was. Um, Ben, were you able to get any more firmer numbers on the water and electricity rates I that would be charged? A, that would be impossible for me to project. Um, the, the idea of water and electricity, uh, it's an upcharge. The town would charge more money to be at the dock. Usage, I absolutely have no ability to predict. No. Are there consultants that can do that to say, okay, if we expand with, you know, 22 docks and, water, you know, water and electricity? Because I'm just trying to get a clear financial picture. I just don't have a clear So, so if, if we had slips uh, where um, we knew we could accommodate 40-foot boats, three 40-foot boats, two 30-foot boats, but we don't. So what we have is just linear space. We could have one, two... We could have four 60-foot boats show up, and, uh, or we could have eight 30-foot boats show up. So without having any, and we don't, we don't have any metric, we don't have water and electricity available to voters. So I don't have any data that I could use to project out. Isn't it going to be possible if we do when we do this, if we do this, to, you'll get built on a monthly basis water and electricity, so you'll get a really quick sense of what the right. expenditure so, is. Right. So I, I would assume that everything would be metered, so we know what was being used. And if it's if it's way above <coughs> what we are anticipating, you can adjust. You can adjust the yeah. rate. That's what you do. And that's the beauty of the app, right? It's a Really quick solution. I can edit. I can edit. I can edit right now the amount that we charge uh, at the dock, and it would be in place for tomorrow. That's that's how easy it is. So, is it one meter? I mean, I'm sorry for my ignorance. Is it well, one meter for the? So, I don't know about Massachusetts, but in Maine, you can't resell electricity. So, we aren't selling electricity. We're selling dock space. Uh, X number of feet uh, per day. So 
if we look at our water use and electric use and see uh, that the fee isn't high enough to be covering that and all of the, the related expenses or it cuts into what we're expected to be generating, then we can adjust that fee upward and it could be on a scale. It's going to be very slow in May, building in June through uh, mid-September, and then cycling back down. It can be like Uber. But, uh, it could be, yeah. it could be like Uber. Yeah. Generally, you don't do that. You set your uh, perfect fee, and that's, that's how communities do it. So, and then one water meter. Right, one water meter, uh, one electric meter. The posts would not be metered. We wouldn't know specific usage for a specific boat. We know, you know daily if we wanted to do it that way or, or weekly or monthly. Not per vessel. You get two hands up up there. So. Um, Sarah. Sarah Creighton. <laughs> Hi. Oh. Um, our, do we have a final con uh, draft condition? Or are we working off those from last meeting? So that's my. Um, and then I have two other comments. I when I spoke with Mark shortly before the meeting started, he said he had uh, drafted conditions on Reed Park, but not Vermont Pier. And he was going to send them to me when I left my house. I hadn't seen them yet. Uh, Mark, I don't think you're still there. I think he's off um, at this okay. point. Um, so he has done a draft for Reed Park, and as soon as we get it, we'll send it to everyone. We'll certainly have it. Um, everyone will have it within the next couple of days. Um, and then he'll have more Pier done, he said, in the next few days. Um, so okay. oh, I think we'll... So then so then um, we probably can't vote this tonight if no. we don't have final conditions. No. Um, so then I have two uh, additional um, conditions that maybe we can pass to Mark. Um, the first is, I think, this discussion of electricity and water is a good one. Um, and I think we should have a condition that the electricity and water is metered um, so it can be charged. Now we'll let the town administrator and the town um, the charge to the to this expense account, and maybe to facilitate that, um, or some language to that effect. And then the um, and the other question or, or comment on conditions uh, that did not come up again tonight is that Brian, I think you had said you would be willing to get rid of the finger dock that is perpendicular to the main dock, um, approximately where the harbor. Um, master boat is docked right now. Um, is that still uh, consistent with what you're willing, yes. you, you find, yep. feel is acceptable? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. It would be helpful to for both to just detail that with some language that, or, or give us the plan, revised plan that reflects that. Um, and also um, to give us language that is specific to the lights. Um, that the that the illumination will be um, you know flush mounted or, or or essentially you know no more than two inches above the deck or whatever it is going to be, um, and that the utility poles are going to be of you know approximately this this many of them at this uh, height because I think otherwise we're we're kind of a little bit in the dark on that. I'm literally in the dark uh -huh. right now. <laughs> <laughs> Where is she? Well, we'll let some light in the darkness. I'm sitting outside. <laughs> scary, Sarah. So I, a couple of things there was, it sounds like the dock is, uh, that little piece of dock is off the table. If we could get both to detail the um, lights in, in a written document that says this is what's going to happen. And then my suggestion uh, for a discussion among others is meter the electricity and the water. And maybe what I'll 
I'll follow up with Mark Resnick when he's feeling better is include, he can take a, a first cut at that kind of thing and then buy and maybe mm -hmm. you can review it and see if it fits the concerns. So can I just ask one question? Because yes, we received a lot of documents over the last day or two. Yes. And I may be getting them confused, but there were letters from residents and I think there was one on this about there is. fiscal impact. There state, is. Right? Yes, yes we so had a well. we had an email from Lorraine Iovani um, regarding this, yes. Right. Thank you for that yeah. reminder. And I, I just thought in that she made some good points about um, residents' interest in seeing that if it's possible. Something Can I interject, else? Sue? Yes. Um, I asked Sarah Mellish about this question, um, and she said that the um, FinCom did uh, discuss these um, projects back when the grants were being applied for, so perhaps we can ask her to summarize their discussions. Great idea. And I think if we could repost them or something on the website, that might be helpful too. Yeah. Actually, can I, I'm going to amend that. Bayan, can you connect with her and get a, a, um, through and with Mark just to coordinate that since I'm away? Yeah, I can do that. Great, thank you. Uh, I think it's fair to point out that in that email, which I have a copy of, the reference was to the select board. Okay. You can't hear, speak up. I can do that. Uh, the, the, this email addresses um, the select board. And the select board uh, has heard all of the, the same detail and with detail and voted to move this forward. And actually came to the last planning board meeting and spoke in support. Yeah. Three members. So I think the select board would, uh, I'm not going to speak for them, but I think they've done their due diligence and received the, the uh, information that they need to be comfortable that uh, it's feasible and that this facility will not cost the voters of this town. Uh, Certainly, uh, the Reed Park project is 100% funded by two grants. There's there's no Wiley funds, there's no tax dollars, there's no town dollars being spent on that project. Of the $1.165 million uh, estimate for that project, none of it's coming from the town. So I, I think the way, the way I read that letter, and I could be wrong was that because the select board doesn't do the financial analysis they had just come up with a governance policy that all projects look at that which we have in our bylaw anyway so we as a board need to do that for a special permit anything else from the board on the park morse care Laura. I was just going to say that on the conditions, I mean, I think we've heard some questions. We've had a number of letters of support, so um, I think it would be good to kind of collect those as part of the documentation of the project. I recall, by on you saying that the commercial fishermen community supported this. I, I just don't remember if that was one of the letters. It was. It was. It was. Yeah. The letters. It was. Okay, so yeah. I think it would be useful to yes. kind of collect that with... Um, that was forwarded to... Yeah, we got that. I do yeah. remember that now. Yeah, yeah, thanks for dragging my memory. And then if the select board has, has the select board, you said they voted to? Yes. Yes. Um, so I think that's part of the, you know, documentation. And then the conditions may want to say that it's, it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg, but it's also dependent on receiving the second order of conditions from the CONCOM and that they would, um, that they would pass it. And I think that together with uh, what 
Sarah Melch could provide, um, you know, provides a lot of background. I see that he's got his hand up too, so he's kind of, so DPW might have something to add, but those are the ones that come to mind as, um, you know, kind of points of reference. And I'm in favor of the lower light, not the vertical standing element, but the lower um, mountain, kind of flush mountain or curb mountain. However, if we did it that way, you'd still have to have your utility pole for your water and your... Right. Yeah, it's just fewer vertical elements kind of in the fusion. So the way, they, they all cover lights, so I don't have my price guys, but uh, as we discussed at the last meeting, we just would not have the bulbs as simple as that. It would be the separate lower unit that appropriate amount of spacing to make sure it's safe. We don't want anyone to trip. No. So I agree. If there's a certain yeah. minimum foot candle that needs to be, or average foot candle that needs to be met, then that should be met. Uh, Greg, did you want to add something? Greg? I'm just gonna, there? Yeah, I'm just gonna, thank you. I was just going to follow up on um, select board review of the finances there. They did review the, the numbers that I think Bob Ryan has also presented to you. Um, I feel very comfortable that the uh, transit knocks in particular will be a net revenue gain um, fairly significantly um, in the $140,000, $150,000 range as a net gain to the town as a conservative number. Um, and that those dollars then can um, certainly be a strong source of funding for future um, harbor projects from dredging to float repairs, um, et cetera. So they did review those others and they felt comfortable with them and that the, um, they are quite um, convinced that this is, a, from, a, from a financial perspective, uh, a net positive for the town. Uh, DPW. We've been waiting a long Thanks. time. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I just wanted to jump back to the utilities portion. Uh, so for a water meter, we would only install one meter uh, as a master meter. And then I would assume would be the same for electric. Uh, I guess to get into the numbers, we can make some kind of small assumptions. I think Bayan previously said that uh, having utilities, we could charge, go from charging $3 a foot to $5 a foot. So, you know, assuming, you know, you get a 25 foot boat in there, that's essentially a $50 difference uh, for each night uh, that a boat is staying uh, that is tied to the utilities. The town charges $7.21 per 100 cubic feet of water uh, used, which is uh, 748 gallons. Uh, so I think we can pretty confidently say that uh, you know, water usage is going to be inconsequential to uh, you know, that rate and eating into any of that profit. Uh, electric, you know, I'm guessing is going to be a bit, a bit higher, not knowing exactly how much, you know, boats use if a, you know, a larger boat comes in and is using air conditioning or the like that, you know, they're using, you know, even call it 10 to 20 kilowatt hours, you know, the rate we have from National Grid, I think, is on the range of like 25 to 30 cents per kilowatt hour. So again, we're only really talking about potentially you know, five to ten dollars of electric, uh, you know, per boat uh, on a given night when we're potentially charging, you know, fifty dollars more just having those utilities on site. Thanks, Nate. Yes, thank That's you. Very helpful. Six dollars. <laughs> Some places charge a heck of a lot. Oh, yes, more than they that. do. <laughs> I know my friend said. This is really cheap. You did did your dock wire thing. This is really inexpensive to come here. Yeah. Oh, so that will connect that. So the, the potential is there for that facility too. So as always, I point out this is a great means for this harbor to be self-sustaining, not be a burden on the taxpayers, which it, it was. 13 years ago uh, to stop being uh, a harbor that has the highest, some of the highest mooring fees in the state. They were the highest for a while, but some of the highest in the state beating up on the boaters here. This is money that we're generating from boats from away. 
to help maintain and keep this harbor a harbor. And without this, what's the plan? To go back to raising mooring rates, to going to taxpayers who spend so much money on things like PFAS and schools and cheap communities. Um, seems like a, a, a pretty great way for the harbor to be self-funded. Thank you. Sarah Creighton, did you want to? I have two other, uh, um, I think the, one of the things that is a good thing for potential small voters in town is the inside, the um, use of the inside of the stock for small boats. And I'm wondering um, if there's a kind of a mooring list. I mean, I don't want to micromanage how this gets used, but are there any conditions that we should be thinking about, I guess, for the um, inside, you know, the shallow side of the stock. Um, I do think that that is a benefit to people who want to have a small boat, is that they will have plenty of um, tie-up space. But um, are there any conditions that should be applied to that? Um, so you and maybe, uh, I, I don't have a specific um, condition. Um, and then the other is, um, Again, I'm not sure it's a special permit condition, but I we've talked about the fact that when there's a big blow in you know a, a you know tropical storm Debbie, that um, warring holders, particularly from the outer areas, maybe should be able to tie up to this dock and not have it be a transient dock. Is that um, I'm not sure that the, either of those are special permit conditions, but rather harbor master policy. So I just want us to think about whether they should be conditions in some way, or so those, those buy, maybe Brian, you have some specific thoughts. Yeah, those those are both absolutely uh, relevant. And in practice, uh, the 250 feet we have down there now is already used for Area Seven voters uh, in the event of a storm. That's that's been practice, and we haven't charged. Uh, we have not tried to take financial advantage of uh, you know, boats that could be in trouble. And that would be the continued practice. And obviously 500 feet will get us a lot more of those area seven boaters in safely. Um, I think that that's something that the HHC should put forward um, in the rules and regulations change. What do you think, Chris? Is yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, so Chris, Chris is on the Harbor Advisory Committee. Yeah, which is why I stick around. Uh, and then as far as the, uh, the idea of maybe taking advantage of that space on the inside of the dock, I, I agree with Sarah 100%. We can look at, uh, right now we have a maximum length of 12 for boats tying up at town docks. Uh, I think there's an opportunity there that we could offer something for boats 13, 15 feet as well. And that would be another harbor advisory uh, committee thing. Number two, that this isn't built yet, and just like the current docks, it's going to figure itself out. We we do rent space to people with 12 foot inflatables or boats now who don't have a mooring. There's room enough so that we've been able to do that for $200 a season. They get a place to tie up their dinghy. If we could expand that to boats 13, 15 feet. And that would also take some of the burden off those folks who might be waiting for a mooring. We might prefer something, uh, a dock instead. So that would be a, a benefit as well. So, here, so just here. to close that out, I think you're, sorry to, so to jump in, but um, I think you're arguing that that's a policy matter, not a special permit condition. Yeah, I think I am. Okay. Yeah. I think I agree with you. For the Harbor Advisory Committee. So unless there's anything else, I think that our plan will be, assuming Mark starts feeling better, 
um, that we'll all see some draft special conditions um, for both of these projects within the next week or so. So we should have plenty of time to review them before our September meeting. Um, and we should be able to make a decision then. Does that sound doable? Pardon? We have a couple of hands up. Since my computer died. Um, who? who? Mary. Well, somebody just went down, but Sandy Rogers. Anybody else? Somebody else. I was the other person. Gail. Oh, Gail, you're still on? Oh, good. Um, of course you're still on. Um, I'm always sorry. here. <laughs> you can't get rid of me. I'm sorry. I don't want, I no. don't want to get rid of you. Um, Sandy was, Rogers, you're up again. Sandy Rogers. Hi. Hi. Um, I thought you were saying Gail, so sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I just have a question, and I don't know if this is part of what goes to the CONCOM for Reed Park or what you need to consider, but um, is there any work that needs to be done to Reed Park to get the utilities to the dock and any considerations regarding that? the safety of the utilities because of what Sarah mentioned regarding um, poor uh, weather conditions, um, you know, special treatments that need to be done, um, especially with electricity, et cetera. Um, has that been looked at? So, yeah, at the last meeting uh, in particular, it uh, was agreed that the tree warden would be part of uh, the process getting the utilities from the street down to the pier to ensure that uh, none of the, the foliage or the beautiful trees were impacted negatively by this. So absolutely, uh, there will be some work uh, in the park getting those utilities across to the pier. As far as... And that's part of what's covered in the grant? Yes, yeah. Absolutely. That's that. And maintenance over, like, you know, whatever period of time needs to be considered in the budget for all this. Right. So maintenance is uh, part of what we will cover with the revenue. And actually, uh, the projected revenue from Morse Pier uh, is almost double what our budget is right now for the care of floats and piers in town. So. Uh, There'll be more than enough revenue to ensure that these facilities remain tip top, first class uh, places like they are now. And once um, I, I, I just want to reiterate, just with any any project, I think that we should have updated um, specs. We should have a view. I know you weren't given the budget, but I'm just as a citizen. I think it's very important that we have this. It sounds like we're not only having pilings, we're also adding extra poles for the utilities, for the water, for the lighting, and all this kind. I, I, I truly think that's important. Also, um, there are rules and regulations in Massachusetts around docks. So I'm certain you'll have the right people that are installing something like this. But when I was hearing um, the select board talking about making it a walkway and everything, um, the pitch at low tide is well beyond what is acceptable um, by regulations. And then when you start to think about the length of the dock, who's going to be overseeing the safety of citizens that are um, walking on it, that are maybe you're talking about adding benches and sitting and sitting up higher and I think that all of that needs to be looked at very carefully before anything like this is a, is approved, yet let alone have it in front of the town citizens to decide. Thank you. Um, Mary or Peter, can you tell me if there's anybody else? There isn't. Um, no. Should we close the hearing? I would one? love to have a motion to <clears throat> close this hearing and continue it to September 9th. We're going to uh, close it or we're going to continue? Or we're going to continue it, thank you, to September 9th at, let's say, 8 o'clock. Um, hello, this is Dean. 
I have a comment, but I'm not sure if I should say it now or wait till the public comment se section of the agenda. But it is regarding this project. Okay, now is the time. Okay, well, um, I found a plan um, from the town hall that showed the, the outline of the work. And I had a comment earlier at an earlier meeting about the um, historic impact and the, the visual of this. Um, and what I've decided, what I've looked at from this is to consider removing section, everything from section BB to FF. That, you know, section BB can stay, we'll add a finger dock for the fishermen, but to remove that 70 foot section of Reed Park and put it at the other end along the railroad tracks. Um, that would go a long way towards minimizing the impact of our scenic harbor and still have some growth for, for the town uh, dock space. Um, so that, that was the, the, the um, idea that I had to, for considering. Thank you. Thank you. Is that possible? So uh, the configuration as proposed as presented is most beneficial. Uh, we're fronting railroad tracks and a waste treatment plant. We're not fronting uh, homes and businesses, which can still benefit from this. Um, Fine, which, which section? I don't have that. That's Reed Park. Park. So Reed Park goes down along the railroad tracks and to the drawbridge. The other section, the Morris Pier, comes around from Morris Pier along the dredge line that was done in 2017 and 18, around to Reed Park with fingers that will accommodate six to seven lobster boats. So they're actually, you, you folks should have received, you were afforded a, uh, a simple uh, rendering of, of what this would look like. I, I can show this on screen if I can just get permission to share. Yeah. <laughs> As by I, unfortunately, I think the capacity for that uh, is we don't have it. Yeah, yeah. Do yeah. <laughs> uh, um, you click on his square? Um, I get host disabled participant screen sharing. So. Uh, Kind of visualize what he can say. Right. So if we're removing part of the fisherman's facility and then putting it down on the other end along the railroad track. So coming down here and then we make we make the turn and then we make the turn to where you are now. And he wants to add it further down. So if I understand correctly, remove that, most of that, and put it down on the other end. But the other end is already taken up right in the park. We're already and the going up and the fishermen needs to be next to their yeah. facility, right. which they've been using so Gail, for maybe Gail can do it. the history of the town. I, 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 I personally don't think that moving the fishermen from their home is beneficial to the character of the town. Mm -hmm. They've been there for centuries. centuries. We were adding a fishing dock for the, uh, a finger dock for the fishermen. So that there would be two instead of the one that's there now. Right. So that expands their facility, yeah. and you can move your facility away. It was a mistake to kind of put it towards the road like that and block the view from from Beach Street. Um, this, what I'm suggesting, would open up so that we could have our scenic harbor view and not uh, all this commercial boating stuff in our residential town. Um, I'm just trying to be less reckless with our harbor. It's a beautiful harbor, and I hate to see it exploited this way. Uh, um, I don't. I don't think it's an exploitation to ensure that the commercial entity that's been in that part of the harbor, that specific part of the harbor, for centuries. That's the why pier, we're improving it. We're adding a finger. Here was built in 1969 with private money by a gentleman who wanted to ensure the fishermen of this community had a home going forward. And so uh, I, I support that. I wholly support that. Putting, I lobster, support that. putting I lobster support that. at the head of the harbor, the part of the harbor where they have always been, 
not detriment. The public totally supports the commercial fishermen. We do not support. I, I, I have to. I have soft. to. No, I have to cut you off. Um, sorry. I know. I know you do. Through. I'm sorry. No, I get it. But I just want to make one point um, that the just public on one completely second, supports the commercial fishermen in the town 100 percent. We just are having trouble embracing adding docks that don't support the town, don't support the residents, don't support moorings, and are just for a three-month tourist season, which is not going to help the town in general. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. I had one more response. Yeah. <laughs> so I would encourage uh, all the folks who come and uh, have questions and comments to come and speak to me in my office, to look at the plans, to try to give the Harbor Department the opportunity to share the rationale why we can bring this to the Harbor Department, Department to bring forward for the benefit of the town. So come see me. Nobody ever comes to the don't take it personally. No, I don't take it personally, but it's, it is disappointing. A lot of commenting in meetings, but nobody comes to ask the questions beforehand. I do. You yeah. <laughs> Credit to Mary, gold star. Oh, well, I didn't want that. <laughs> yeah, Mary does. I thought this was the venue where we were supposed to give our opinions. Uh, me too. Oh. I would love to meet with you. Mr. Bayon. Anytime my doors go. Name the day. I would love to sit down and talk about the harbor. Thank you so much. Well, Thank you. Thanks for your comments. All right. Now, uh, a motion to continue this hearing to September 9th so at moved. 8 p.m. So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Sarah? Yeah. Great. And I guess we have to do a roll call again. Uh, Mary Foley. Yes. Do I? Yes. I think I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Maybe I don't. Well. <laughs> I don't think I do. Sorry. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 So, Chris, did you want to quickly talk about MBTA? Yes, I think Mark was going to do it, oh, but right. since he's not here, I'll <coughs> try to fill issues on this. So, Mark has been able to get a grant from MHP to pay for the propensity for development study in the MBTA districts. Uh, we don't know when the study will be ready. We're hoping for the end of September. <clears throat> um, we also asked RKG for a date for they could do the feasibility impact study for economic impact on the town. And they said they could have it done by November 1st. November 1st. <clears throat> so we said... <coughs> Maybe as an alternative, we could get the FinCon to do the economic feasibility <clears throat> analysis. And the benefit of that, there are two benefits. One is it could get it done very quickly, theoretically. And secondly, it wouldn't be some third party consultant from Boston or somewhere. It would be us, the town, doing it. So um, one of the things that might be a useful vote would be to authorize uh, Sarah Malich. Well, authorize Sarah Creighton to oh, Sarah Creighton. request the economic feasibility study from the FinCom. And can I ask you something about that? So, has the FinCom been um, approached yet? About so, it? I've talked to Sarah Malich about it, and she said that she'd be happy to oh, awesome. do it. So. Okay. So could I make that motion to authorize Sarah to um, make a request to the FinCom to do this economic feasibility 
analysis. Which means that we won't ask for the independent consultant. Correct. Yes. And we think that by having FinCom do it, it provides the data that residents have been requesting. Yes. And will be received in a credible way. Mid likely more so than an independent consultant, and in enough time for people to consider right. it. Yes. Will it be? Will it provide the objectivity of it right. if people want? Yeah. If we do it ourselves. Mm. What data points are we asking for? What data points? Yeah. So what? What? What is? What is the um, analysis going to show that income is going? Uh, basically, it's going to show what the impact on both cost of services that the town would inc incur, including school, versus the increased tax revenue from the units that might be built. And that would be the same data that we'd receive from an independent consultant? I'm j I don't know. I'm yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. That's, what, I, that's yeah. what the study would do. Okay. So we're essentially getting the same study that we would? I think it would be probably a shorter because it's being done by a bunch of town volunteers, but I think it would, mm. uh, think, you know, they did this for uh, the 40B project. SLV. Yeah. Yeah, the SLV. Uh, and they did it for the, um, for the cell signaling project too. Well, that might be, I think that's a solution, right? Because we can't wait till November 1st. No. That's not useful. And I should, I, I want to say one other thing about this. Uh, Mark talked to Emily about this. And apparently, um, there, there are a couple of problems going on at once. One is every consultant in the state is working on these yeah. feasibility studies. Yeah. The second thing is, is that the state has received something like, I'm not going to be the exact right numbers, but something like 50 uh, pre-submittal um, requests for a review, as we did, and 65 completed town meeting votes. So they've got 110 as of two weeks ago, 110 roughly, I think it was more than that. maybe more, but it's a lot. I mean, that's, so that's, the question is whether, whether we're going to, where's the state in terms of their review and how they're going to do it. So there may be extensions provided. Who knows? We don't know what's going to happen. But I don't so think we should. I, we, can we finish the conversation about the, who we want to, to do this? Sure. Yeah, you know, sure. I'd like to ask a question about what you just said, because that's kind of scary. <laughs> well, it's probably scarier for the state than for us. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, Laura. You said something something was going to be available in September with another consultant. I heard November and September. So September would be for the propensity for development, okay. which would tell us what the estimate would be for actual units to be built every year for the next year. So there are two different studies, the financial yes. impact yes. and the propensity. So the financial one well, has to depend. Well, got to be linked together. Well, you can't do the financial one until you've got the propensity yeah, for development. Right, one right. but we're going to do that with the consultant. Yes. That we've already. That's planned, because we've got a grant for us, so we're going to start that, and we'll have that by September, whatever. 30th, did you say? Yeah, we already voted on did you, yeah. did you say okay. 30th, Chris? Is that what they told you? Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to be held to a date. I don't know. Right. Okay, so we get that in, and then the FinCom does their analysis of costs. Yeah, so of course the FinCom it doesn't have to revenue. wait until we get the actual right. study to begin. They can start thinking about how many students would be per unit, you know, do it all on a per unit basis. Yeah, and in terms of the deliverable that we would get if we went to a consultant, and there are, I can understand they're busy right now because everybody's trying to do this. Do we know what those criteria are that they'd be looking at and, and what so you know, metrics they would use? One of the things actually Sarah Mellish asked for was an example of a That's what I think we need. Done. We if can we get, get, get an example and then the FinCop could model their exactly. calculations on that, then we know we're apples to apples. Yeah. Well, we can use the, um, the NEEDM. Was it NEEDM? Yeah. Was, uh, I mean, there are some. There that, are some that are done. That towns have yeah. done, and they're on their town website. So, if um, you've already, if the task force has already pulled a couple of those, 
and you can meet with the FinCom and talk about yeah. their methods yeah. and the deliverable, then I think that would help to get a level of confidence in the product. No, no, no shade on the FinCom, but just you know, wanting to make sure that we're going to doing the same type of analysis. Yeah. That I would just have a concern and that we um, try to look at multiple avenues because September is when FinCom ramps up their budget season. Um, so I would question if they actually have the bandwidth to do this, but um, that would be one concern that I would have. Um, any suggestions? Well, my suggestion is that we would have asked for this six months ago when we were talking about it, but um, I think um, I mean, if our town planners reached out to all of the companies you can think of that does these analysis and they're all busy, I mean, I, I guess I don't have any other suggestions, but I don't know the answer to that. But other than tapping into, is it Emily? Is that our consultant's name? Mm -hmm. Just yes. to have her help us as much as she can. Yes, sure. Yeah. She's probably completed some, right? That she can. Might let us she know. doesn't do economic feasible no. or impact analysis, but her the partner friend does. That's who we asked to do it, and that's when they said they'd have it done by November. And she would know what is required of the study. Yeah, sure. She'll have, I'm sure she yeah. will help. Yeah. Yeah. So is everybody okay with yeah. should we vote on it? We probably should vote on it. I made a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. So is the motion just to ask the FinCom? Yes. Yes. Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> yeah. Aye. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. 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 Scary, Sarah. <laughs> Where are you, Sarah? <laughs> you look like a, a, a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> Not you personally. <laughs> are you looking at the meteor no. showers? No, yeah. I actually am going to sign off um, and I'm going to say goodnight because um, my batteries are just about gone. Don't <laughs> into the dark. Thank you. Thank you. So wait, sorry, Chris, you started talking about the timetable around. Um, oh, so, so we're, I guess there's facts. some lack facts. of facts. 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 We don't know when the state's going to do our review. We know they are reviewing over a hundred uh, submissions. It's crazy. So if they, and I don't know whether this is, it's late, I forget, I, we'll probably talk about this later. So. Great suggestion. <laughs> Put a pin in it. Let's right? not speculate. <laughs> are there any liaison committee reports? Harbor management plan advisory groups. They've come and gone. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. CPC. Nothing on the CPC. Do. No. Um, AHT. Uh, nothing on that for now. And we've already covered the MBTA task force. I did send everybody a memo of dates to just stick in your calendar temporarily for public outreach informational um events that we schedule um when did you send that you said you sent that to it's, i think it was in the packet oh okay all right um here you can have this one. Oh, thanks <laughs> oh, actually, i do have one thing there, uh, we're hoping to have a joint meeting with the task force on March 22nd. I don't know March March 22nd <laughs> March. <laughs> uh, August 22nd a week from Thursday I don't know. Is are people available? I'm not available. It's just curious. Was that intended to be a public hearing or just a no? Just okay. a meeting. So can we do it virtually? Sure. Oh yeah, of course. Yep. I'm not available. I'm not available. No. <laughs> okay. So you need a I'll just we'll just have a meeting. Of the task we have minutes to approve. I believe we have one. Uh, thank you. Um, any other public comment? Okay. Uh, approval of minutes, July 9th. 
I move they be approved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any other matters not anticipated? Great. How about a motion to adjourn? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's such fun. <laughs> I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Uh...